What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. I remember I had to do a, what's called a CTR, a close target reconnaissance. It was broad daylight, it was in Tikrit, Sodom's uh, hometown. There was a strike force lined up and we're gonna hit this one particular target in this neighborhood, which is a bad neighborhood. My job was to go in dressed up as an Iraqi. So I drive in, the assaulters all get out, they're running into the compound, and there's a little kid standing outside, about two years old, little Iraqi kid. And when he sees all these assaulters barging into the compound, coming after his dad, he just lost his in the street. I'm out of the vehicle, I got my weapon in my hand, and I see this kid, and all I can think about is my own son. Mm. Right? I remember my son when he was two years old, same height and everything, you know, and just ran over and I picked this kid up in my arm, holding him, I got armor on, got my weapon and my long gun in my right hand, I'm holding my left hand, I'm like, it's okay, little buddy, everything's gonna be okay. I'm not sure he understood me or not, but I'm thinking, we're gonna go in there, they might just kill his dad right now, you know, I don't know what they're gonna do, depends on what kind of fight he puts up. I gotta hold this little kid, you know. Well, what do you think of of China and all that. And the reason I ask that is because I, I kind of go in either direction on this one. So for a long time, I felt like no one was talking about China. And I would always be like, are we not going to look at this? Right. And there were plenty of other people out there saying the same thing, but it wasn't like a mainstream thing to talk about the growth of China and stuff like that and what threat that could pose to the United States. And then over the past year and a half or so, it's become totally in vogue to talk about. I don't know why that happened, but you, you kind of have two camps with this. You have the camp of Andy Bustamante, who's been on my show and now he's been on like every podcast in the world where, you know, from his perspective as a CIA case officer who he's allowed to say like he worked in, in Asia, that was a place he spent a lot of time. You know, China is the biggest threat we got in front of us. They're going to yeah. overtake us, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's why I feel like Taiwan is is not long for this world. If I could take my family to Taiwan in the next two years so they could see how beautiful Chinese culture is, I would take them. Because after that, I won't be able to take them. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm for all, it's not just me saying it, right? But, but if you haven't heard it before, look for Taiwan to get taken by China in 2024. And then you get the other camp, which is more like the Peter Zion camp. He's a, foreign policy strategist online, very big. And he talks about how China's demographics are f f COVID actually backfired on them. They're going to have a famine inside of 15 years or something like that. And I hope he's right, to be honest. I mean, I don't hope for famine on people, but I mean, as far yeah. as like China not being a, a, a threat, I hope he's right. And I hope Andy's wrong, but I'm kind of like in between the two where it's like, yeah, you have Xi Jinping, who's a communist, really psycho, let's call it what it is. And he's got such this grip on power that now, you know, he's paranoid and this is usually how these guys go and it's, it ends up going the wrong way. But on the way there, you know, they're buying up so many things around the world. They have so much influence around the world now on the way to, say, a crash of the CCP, if that's what it's going to be in 15, 20 years. Could we have enormous problems? I tend to think, yeah, we could. But where, what, what's your thought on, on them as, as, global threat if you will yeah i think they're i think they're the number one threat um like for example i just came back from the philippines and uh there was already uh, they just had a clash the filipinos and the chinese at uh along the straits there and literally the boats ran into each other <laughs> they had a clash uh, yeah i mean literally yeah they, literally two boats ran into each other right because they're both claiming the waters there belong to, to each other and uh so that happened you know that just happened a few days ago um you know, the Chinese are literally dredging up uh, the seafloors around Taiwan. They're disrupting the, 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 the areas for fishing, um, the reefs and things like that. They're literally taking the, 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 the sand from the bottom or from around Taiwan and they're building islands around other areas, um, strategic islands, if you will. We also know that uh, they've, they've apparently... The, the Indonesians have already recovered several um, drone submarines that have washed up around Indonesia from the Chinese, where they're mm. actually doing underwater uh, surveys, um, surveying the you know the waterways. So, okay, doing surveys, doing reconnaissance. Okay, we all do that, you know. But uh, kind of interesting that this is actually happening at the same time. You know, there's this rift between Taiwan and China, and now there's a r growing rift between the Philippines and China. Um, you know. There are some, you know, 
I think Chinese people for the most part are actually pretty good people. I say that. Um, it goes back to the, you know, the people in, in power, man. Um, yep. The decisions they're making because not all Chinese are bad. I got a lot of friends that are Chinese and they're okay. They're yeah, not, the, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, the know? Communist Party only controls, I think, like 6.9% or of the country is a, is a member of that party. Yeah. And who, who knows how many of them are unwitting members too, right? Yeah. The, like the people... They're just living under the control. It's not yeah. their fault. Yeah. No, you know, and so um, it always comes back to the freaking politicians, you know, and uh, there's got to be a reckoning one day. So, I mean, the entire world population just needs to stand up and say, enough's enough. All you assholes in charge, you're out, you know. <laughs> Here, we're starting all over, you know, and you're going to do this right. I think that's the only way it's going to change, but uh, it's never it's never happened in history. Um Everything just keeps collapsing and rebuilding and collapsing. And as long as there's what the three P's, power, and you know, yep. and money, um, it's it's never gonna it's never gonna end. Um, my wife my, my wife speaks uh, Kand- uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, Old Chinese, uh, English, Sundanese, Bahasa. She speaks six languages, and uh, she's got a sixth grade education too, by the way. But she's worked quite a quite a bit over the years for Chinese families. Um, I was like a lot of Indonesians, she was a maid, you know, mm. and uh, and from all reports, you know, for the most part, they were always pretty good, pretty good people, you know, um, to her, and uh, and I like I said, I've known a lot of Chinese. It's not not an issue with those personally. It's just at the higher levels, you know, and uh, it's no different from our country, from the Chinese, from the Russians. But I do think they're a threat. Um, I think they smell blood in the water too. I think they see what's going on, and I think that's why I'm kind of thinking we may not see the next election. I might, we might be in a world war before then. We're actually, I hope you're wrong about We're that. already in a war. Actually, we're already in a world well, war. Well, it's all proxy, war by proxy. Well, yeah, five, you know, fifth generation, man. Right now, it's exactly, it's proxy wars, um, and it's a different type of war, just because it hasn't gone ballistic. Well, it has gone ballistic, and it has gone kinetic, not to the level that we normally would expect in a war, but we're in war. Um, it's literally a war. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, things like s- uh, social media, you know, TikTok, these are all parts of the PSYOPs campaign, you know. These are all tools, you know, they're in a form, a form of weapon, if you will, to manipulate minds and, and garner, you know, um, you know, trust and garner people, you know, get people on their side, you know, and, and just throw everything in disarray. You know, we talk about TikTok here in, in America, you know, it's like it's geared towards knuckleheads. But when you go look at TikTok in China, it's like, you know, they're actually educating and yes. training their kids, you know. So yes. It's all programmed, man, you know. And uh, there's definitely, there's hardcore programming happening around the world right now. Yeah. It's a very fascinating and scary thing. Yeah. But that it's it sucks. Like, I've used this phrase or terminology, whatever you want to call it before, that is really tough to rectify, but it's, it's kind of true. It's like our democracy is used against itself. Mm-hmm. So like, we love that. We love democracy. We love freedom. That's awesome. And we try to, we try to. And I don't think we do a good job, but we try to like spread that to the rest of the world. You look at China, communist rule, that's terrible. The one advantage they have is right there because they have total control. Yeah. They can have all their little kids watch Einstein and science experiments and stuff and get excited about science and math. And our kids just look at titties, <laughs> right? And that think about that, though. Think yeah. about what that no, does across a population yeah. to the mind. And like, obviously, you know. Yeah. Kids who are teenagers, they like that stuff. But if that's all they're watching, you know, and the younger kids as well, if that's all they're watching, they're just watching mindless stuff and going, boop, yeah. boop, boop, boop. Whereas in China, oh, they shut you off at 8.30. You're not allowed to access it again. And you're watching science and math. Yeah. What do you think's going to happen? Right. There's a lot of merit to that, you know. Um, I think it's really... How do you navigate that, right? On one hand, how do you, you're right, you know, we enjoy freedom, democracy, you know, on all those types of things. We don't, look, we don't, I don't want to be controlled, you know, for example, I mentioned uh, digital currency, you know, to me, that is, that will be the ultimate enslavement and you won't even know you're being enslaved. You know, once you have digital currency, um, they can regulate everything you do, where you go, when you go, um, social credits, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, um, that's why I'm dead set against it. And I know a lot of very wealthy people that are dead set against it also because they know now their wealth 
is going to be managed and controlled. It's going to be hard for them to, to do uh, do anything. Now with that's money. a good thing. If the wealthy people, if if you're right about that, your anecdotal experience with the different people you deal with, yeah. that's a good thing. You need yeah. the wealthy people to not be about that stuff. Yeah, and so, um, but on the other hand, I just feel like, man, we have uh, our society has so eroded, man, over the years. To, I mean, look, I mean, we got. We got school districts now saying, "Oh, you don't have to have a passing grade to graduate." Yeah, it's dumb. you know what the yeah. I mean. What is? Yeah, you can't. You, you know? know, we're living in this world where it seems like everybody just doesn't want to make everyone else feel bad. And I'm with you. I don't like making people feel bad. I don't like being a dick to people or anything. But we're we're so afraid of hurting people's feelings that we're not. It feels like we're we're eliminating standards on stuff. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a big problem. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody right. feels good. You know, right. You know what? This is not something new either. This actually was one of the reasons I retired out of the Army in 2001. Um, I remember I was working at the 3rd Special Forces Group headquarters. Uh, I was a group assistant ops and CEO. So I had a little bit of admin time, and I was getting ready for retirement. And I remember um, at the time it was General Shinseki. He was uh, Secretary of Defense. He came down to Fort Bragg. He went to a ceremony, you suck ceremony. He had all the Green Berets there. It was their event. They're all wearing Green Berets. And he was like, wow, look at all the Green Berets, you know? And right there, he made the command decision that everybody in the Army will now wear Black Berets because it looks so cool. And, and then they were like, sir, the Rangers wear Black Berets. I don't care. Everybody gets Black Berets. Like, wow, the Black Beret is something you earn. The Green Beret is something you earn. Actually, the Green Beret is a, um, was, a, uh, was awarded to Special Forces by John F. Kennedy, right? So mm. it's a presidential uh, citation award. So you can't just take that away from SF. And uh, so now all of a sudden, everybody gets to wear a Black Beret because he thought, well, everybody, it will raise their self-esteem. I go, what a bunch of bullshit. You know, and they wore them like pizza hats. They didn't know how to wear black. And then now the Rangers were slighted. Now they got to go to a brown ber uh, beret, you know. And uh, and then things like that just started setting in, right? Then they lowered all the standards. If you graduate, you didn't have to, you didn't have to pass a physical fitness test to get out of basic training. And you could just show up, and it would be your squad leader, team sergeant, or platoon sergeant's job to get you in shape. Like, wow. And then it went a step further. I had a water team in Special Forces, right? We did water infiltration. And uh, so if you're going to be on a water team, you probably should know how to swim, right? And so, <laughs> so, and so, they, so they're not, the rule came down, oh, guys don't need to know how to swim anymore to get into special forces. Like, well, who we talk, well, who, why was that and who are we catering to, you know? So you're telling me a guy can show up on my team today and tomorrow my team's got to do a real world water mission, but, you, you know, this guy can't swim. What am I supposed to do with this guy? Yeah. You know? He's not combat ready. He's not mission ready. He's supposed to come to me ready to go. Um, so all these things started happening even back then. Um, even so far as I remember one time. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's illegal for you to put a military weapon in a privately owned vehicle, right? And so I had a new private. Um, we had to draw weapons. We we're going to do a parachute jump. So we had to go around the headquarters building and get him. He gets his weapon. I didn't know he did this. He took his gun and got into his truck. And drove his truck around to the company area. By the time he showed up, I already got the phone calls. You know, hey, private so and so and so and so has got a weapon in a vehicle. And I like, ah, crap, that's a big deal in the military, by the way. Um, mm. So, I'm like, crap, you know, he's a new guy. He should have known better. Okay, whatever. So he shows up. And normally, what you do is like, you, you know, look, he's a new guy. He didn't know, you know, chew him out. Yeah, you chew his ass. You make him do a bunch of push-ups until you get tired, right? You know, and so you're going to be dumb. I'll make you strong, you know. Start pushing your way to China. Get going. Drop down there, just order, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and I remember I did that because I could have been worse. I could have gave him an Article 15. Um, it really messed him up. And so I got him doing push-ups, and I had this this girl there. She's an E5. She's the uh, uh, ill she's an illustrator for us, right? She makes all the PowerPoint presentations. Ooh. And... Uh, <laughs> And so, yeah, that was her specialty, right? It's like, wow, you know, power, <laughs> PowerPoint specialist, right? But anyway, I'm, I'm her boss. I got to put up with it, right? So whatever. I guess we all got a job. And she gets mad because I make them do push-ups. And she, I outrank her by quite a bit. Mm. She's an E5. I'm an E8. 
And she's like getting on my ass about it. That's wrong, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what army do you come from? Because this is what we do, especially in infantry, you know. It's better to make a guy do push-ups than, you know, do something really stupid to the guy. I mean, he's, you know, he's learning. And, uh, well, anyways, that went, you know, that went sideways. And next thing you know, everybody's scared, you know, the chain of command, like, hey, you know, Comstock, you know, uh, do something else. And I'm like, what? You know, what am I supposed to do, you know? And so I ended up, you know what I had to do? I made him go home for the weekend and write an essay on accountability and responsibility, <laughs> right? Can you believe that? And he had to give it to me on Monday, you know? And he couldn't uh, even write, you know? Poor guy. He wasn't too smart, you know? Like, uh, you know, I just realized, man, the Army is just starting to fall apart, you know? Um, and that's when I made the decision. I got to get out and do something else. Um, it's not trending. That's a long well. time ago, though, too. Yeah. It's yeah. not recently. No. That's right. And I saw it. I saw it a long time ago. I saw the trending, you know? And... So I made a decision, yeah, let me move out. And uh, this is not the Army I grew up in. Um, this is not the Army I, I joined up to be a part of. And I can see how it's affecting everything from combat readiness to morale. Um, you know, it's it's not about war fighting anymore. It's about, you know, political correctness and and all this other crap that has nothing to do with it, going out and finding, fighting, f fixing it, and finishing the enemy, you know? Right. And uh, so, yeah, here we are. Yeah. Now, Joe, when I had Joe in here. So my first deployment was to Iraq. And okay. the first time that I actually pulled the trigger shooting at somebody was at a hotel that we were staying at. And our hotel got attacked in the middle of the night by a bunch of douchebags that showed up outside, shot RPGs at the hotel. And I ran up on the roof with a bunch of other dudes. And they were across the street in an abandoned building. And you could see their muzzle flashes. And it was like whack-a-mole. He talked about the whole process because his his situation, as you well know, you're good friends with him, was very unique in that he was a well-trained guy in the military, did his time in, in the Army and the Marines yeah. for like 12 years, but he never had to go into a combat zone. Right. And so he goes to get recruited by Ground Branch, and he was like, I think you guys have the wrong guy. Like, I haven't even seen war. And then, you know, he gets recruited, yeah. makes it, and goes through and ends up, you know, obviously – doing the kind of stuff that, that you've done for years too. But like we, you had talked about after 9-11 contracts started coming in and you were you were doing a lot of work shoring up the defensive nuclear power plants across the United States. Mm. But when the work ended up going beyond that, did you have to go through a whole process again, similar to, to Delta Force like Joe did? How did it work for you? Um, no, because I, I mean, I met all the I was already qualified, so to speak. The only thing I had to do was polygraph test. Mm. Okay. Uh, it's amazing how many people fail polygraph test. Um, a lot of people don't like it. That's not fair, but man, I'll tell you what, polygraph tests work pretty good. <laughs> they work pretty good. Um, and, and it's not a lie detector test. It can't tell if you're lying. Um, polygraph tests are designed so they, it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Monitors. Um, Hear the cops out there. Here they come. I sh knew we should have talked, to, for we <laughs> talked about the C4 earlier. <laughs> coming to get you. Um, you know, but, you know, I think it's pretty accurate. And uh, can it be defeated? Yeah, very difficult to feed polygraph, polygraph tests. But uh, are they pretty accurate? I think so. Um, I've had my experiences with them. And uh, I, won't, I can't go into what happened with me. But, again, because I'd be – telling Wade more than I need to be talking about. But um, that was their only hurdle. But most guys even fail that. The numbers of people that fail that is astronomical. Some of the guys you think are some of the, oh, this guy's a shoe in for sure. He's, whoa, he didn't make it either. <laughs> Holy crap. Is, it, is yeah. there like a normal, a, a common thing that they'll, that'll trip them up every time? Like, oh, did you try weed in high school and they try to say no? Or is it something different usually? Uh, usually it's something different, something more egregious. Um, you know, you could, for example, OPSEC, operational security, right? Um, speaking out of turn or speaking about something you're not supposed to talk about, mm -hmm. especially if you've signed non-disclosure agreements, but you bring it up. Um, Guys, if you're still watching this video and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button, please take two seconds and go hit it right now. Thank you. I remember I got, I got on a, one polygraph one time. I brought up something. Or the question was asked, have I ever talked about uh, something that was classified to somebody else. 
And I thought about it, and I was like, mm, no, not really. But I did think, but as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about one time where I did, but I thought, no, it was okay to talk to him about that. And uh, after I got done with the whole test, okay, we'll let you know the results. The next day I got a phone call, and uh, here's a funny story. So I'm, I'm really beat up. Mentally, I'm beat up, right? This was hell on earth going through one of these damn tests, right? <laughs> and I, I come back to North Carolina, and... And my wife's like, how'd it go? I'm like, oh, my God. I said, that was hell, man. I said, oh, I don't even know what happened, right? And so I go in my bedroom, and I get on a computer, and I look up polygraphs, right? And I, I end up, I'm on a site called antipolygraph.org. My wife walks in, <laughs> and she looks over my shoulder. She goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure out what just happened to me, right? Antipolygraph.org, right? Like, because I didn't have any idea, right? And she goes, you sure you should be doing that? I go, why? She goes, well, what if they're I go, they're not watching that. You know? And then I get the phone call. Sir, why are you on No, no, no. The phone call was, hey, congratulations. You're good to go. You know, we'll call you back in a few weeks. You know, come and talk to us. Oh, okay, good. Oh, wow. All right. I, th th I didn't think I made it, but okay, I guess I made it. Now, I, about six weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, uh, we need to come back up here and do this again. There was a problem with one of the answers and questions. And I'm like, what? I thought it may. And I thought about, do I want to do that again? So I do. I go do it again. And uh, do you have the tack in your shoe so you can step on it and pass it? No, check you ever, this. You ever no, seen that trick? Yeah, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, that doesn't work. So I show up, and I'm not even on the. I'm not even on the machine. I'm sitting there waiting, you know. And it's a different guy this time, different interrogator. He's really nice. The first guy was a total asshole, total asshole, man. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. And uh, this guy's like really nice. The whole Mutt and Jeff thing, right? And he goes, so he goes. He goes, what'd you think about the, the last polygraph? I said, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And he goes, well, let me ask you something. When you went home, did you go to antipolygraph.org? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, how oh, the fuck did he know that, right? And uh, I looked down and I had a choice. And I'm thinking, do I lie <laughs> or do I tell the truth? And then I got kind of defined. I go, yeah, so what, right? And so... He goes, well, I don't blame you. He goes, why would you take an exam without studying, right? I'm like, yeah, that's right, you know. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's right, you know. And he didn't even hook me up. He just asked me a question. He goes, let me ask you something. He goes, did you ever share, you know, classified information with anybody? And I go, well, yeah, I told my captain who also had a clearance, you know, that, you know, something we used to do because it – it was um, related to what we're doing, and I was just showing him an idea that we could implement, you know. And he goes, oh, that's no big deal. Okay, you're good. And that was it. That was it. Like, holy shit. I wow. went through all this just for that, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they're they're pretty – I yeah, they can be pretty nerve-wracking. Um, and some of the stuff people confess to would blow your mind. Um, again, I'm not at liberty to talk about it, but uh, polygraph test, you know, uh, I would say try to avoid it, especially if you're guilty because you're probably going to get popped. <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> um, yeah, for a friend of mine actually who is not guilty and is sitting in prison, life without parole, he's been there for 26 years, he took the polygraph test uh, because he didn't do it. And the, at the end of the test, the polygraph, the polygraph examiner got up and shook his hand and said, it's nice to shake hands with an innocent man. Wow. Which is really powerful. And we're trying to get him out of there. I did an episode on it. Episode Damn. 159. And he turns to the sheriff and says, hey, I got a question for you. And the sheriff, I think, says, what's that? And he says, what's the penalty for perjury? One of my homies is on trial. He didn't do it. They made me say that. I didn't want to say that. And do we know, have we seen this? Do we know who the sheriff is? Yeah. Sheriff, what's his name? John Hamilton. The sheriff was lame. Brian said he, that this wasn't true. And so they let Brian get back on the stand to say what he said to the sheriff. Pretty damn credible. Now, I have someone here who I think could help clear this up a little bit. And I'd like to bring him in if you don't mind. So we're going to have to move that table sure. in a sec. But Alessi, can you bring him in? But yeah. they, they're not, I, I understand and agree with the fact that they're not admissible in court because there are variables that can go wrong and it, that gets to a weird place because then it's, it becomes circumstantial. You can't prove exactly yeah. if not that, then this, right? But, you know, from a government standpoint, I hear everyone talks about it the same way. I've talked about polygraphs. No one likes them. Yeah. <laughs> they suck. But I get why guys who are going to go do the types of shit that a guy like you is being sent in there to do has to be, or Joe or any of those guys, Andy, Jim, like the, the, the stuff that they have to do, 
you got to have a whole extra level of security that maybe the court system doesn't allow. You know what I mean? Because it's just so sensitive. And I got to imagine they're so worried about at all these different places, you know, what if we get someone who's turnable or who has maybe has something on them that is that is a vulnerability that an enemy could use. You know, all it takes is one leaker to fuck the whole ship. True. Um, yeah, just uh, <laughs> stay away. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like you said, they're not they're not one hundred percent accurate. And here's the other thing, right? They cannot tell if you're telling a lie or the truth. It's up to the polygrapher to make that decision, right? He's got to read it and go, hmm. In his estimation, you're being deceptive. That's the word, not lying. Dece- you're indicating deception. Mm. Okay, that's the word they use. It, it indicates deception. It indicates deception. It indicates you're telling the truth. So it's always him that's making that call, yeah. right? Other people can review it, you know, because they, you know, the way it's set up, you ask a question, it correlates with, you know, the, uh, you know, the graph, you know, and this question, what, you know, I see a spike here and I see a drop here and another spike here, you know, and they, they line it all up. But I also feel like, you know, there's another component to this thing is, you know, looking at the guy's body language, you know, um, some guys don't do well under pressure like that, you know, and they could get anxious, you know, and not only that, I found that when I take them, sometimes my want, mind wanders and I overthink it mm. and it make it worse. Like, no, this is not related to this comp stock. Stop thinking about that. But I'm thinking about that because yes. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting things like, no, they're not related, but I yes. want to, because my mind's all over the freaking place. And then, you know, the freaking things going all over the place, you know, the charge. Like, ah. Whoops. Uh, yeah, so you know, I, I believe there's some of that too, and that's probably why it's inadmissible in court. But um, yeah, like you said, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a good way to see, you know, how bad somebody really wants to be a part of the uh, of whatever they're doing, organization, wherever they get it into, you know, and uh, you get a better idea if this guy's telling the truth or not. But some guys can beat it. You can beat it. Um, there are guys that have done it. Uh, What's his name in the FBI? I think it was the FBI. Um, Robert Hansen. Yeah, Hansen, right? Yeah. He got away with it a long time, man. Didn't he just die? I think he just died he in did. prison. He yeah, he did. Florence Supermax. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But uh, and he but he had a lot of training from the Russians, too. Yes. They were training him on how to do that, you know? And uh, Are you trained on how to pass a polygraph no, now? No. I mean, no. I, look, I could I could wing it, but I'm not sure I'll be successful, <laughs> right? The whole pucker factor, roll my toes. Bite my tongue, you know. Fucking think about porn, so whatever, right? <laughs> I don't know if that'll all work or not, you know. Wow. But, um, yeah. Shit gets wild. Yeah. How, how did you? How did you and Joe initially meet each other? By the way, Joe Ted I. Um, actually, the first time I met him was uh, downrange, I believe, uh, Afghanistan. I think is where we met, mm. and maybe. Um, I also worked. So again, while I was doing this contracting stuff. I had my own company. I was also the CEO for another company, and uh, and I was running a project for this company. And Joe came in as one of the subcontractors. That's how I met him there as well. Um, so I've, over the years, I've known him, you know, in passing, doing different projects, whether it was you know government related or corporate related or something like that. And then uh, just kind of following and tracking him over the years. And uh, dis- then I was actually the first one on Discovery Channel. Then he got an opportunity to get on uh, Discovery, and we talked about that. And um, there's a lot of, uh, and I just, I'm going to just go take, take this opportunity real quick to talk about Joe, man. There's a lot of what I call derog- derogatory information out there that's not oh, yeah. true. Um, yeah. I happen to know it's not true. So when people, you know, they say Joe's a fraud, he's not a fraud. Um, he's, there was some, one guy, and I'm not going to give, I'm not going to mention his name, but mm-hmm. uh, he really had a hard on for Joe because Joe got on Discovery Channel, he didn't. And um, long story short, this they went into litigation, all kinds of stuff happened. Joe won the court case. I was come, I came in as a eyewitness because I heard. What the oh, other you guys were on the case. What happened was um, they asked me if I would come in and be a witness because I actually heard what the other guy was going to do. He he told me he was going to intentionally wreck joe's career and his life he was a set him up and i'm like why would you tell me that you don't know me that well but he thought you know we were we were bros we could do that and so and i just realized oh, well maybe these guys got a, a little beef going on i don't want to get in the middle of it and then when i found out where this is what it was leading to and joe had spent a lot of money trying to defend himself oh, yeah. this guy had gone out and 
and he really he he launched a disinformation campaign. You know, special forces, right? And and a lot of people bought into the lie. Yep. Um, and then they started to accuse me of you know wrongdoing and and being a traitor. And I'm like, you know what? Um, you're not going to find any BS about me. I've been transparent about everything I've ever done. Um, you know, if I've done something wrong, I have no problem admitting that. But um, but I said, I'm not going to stand here and watch a man get prosecuted, you know, persecuted, I mean, you know, um, over some lies because this yeah. dude over here is a jackass, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I offered, I said, yeah, I'll be willing to come in and testify. As soon as I did that and I signed the affidavit and everything, um, they wanted to drop the case to sell a lot of course. They did. Yeah. And they yeah, did. Yeah. And uh, they lost a lot of money. Yep. Um, got their ass handed to them. And, uh, a lot of legal fees on the way to that, though. Yeah. I mean, my God. Yeah, that overwhelmed him, Joe, particularly, you know. Fucking crazy. The and, experts, everything. Yeah. I mean, I had a chance to talk with him and some people involved with that case. I, I didn't realize yeah. you were one of the witnesses, too. But yeah. we we just literally just recorded with him right before, yeah. again, where, where you are coming in now. And, you know, there's a lot there, obviously, when you win the case and you sign it, you still sign away some silence, right? So there's things he can't talk about that would really help him if he could. But yeah. he addressed it on camera for a while. I mean, Alessi, that was like the first, what, yeah. 25 minutes of the episode, something yeah. like that? Yeah. And I was glad he got to go as deep as he did on it. It was deeper than I thought he would be able to. But, you know, there I have a special place in my heart for for people who do a lot of do a lot of hard things that other people wouldn't and usually like very brave things yeah. and then people try to take that from them yeah, yeah. and it's it, it's a shame this this is one issue with the military that I run into on the internet sometimes where and sometimes they're right sometimes guys will totally bullshit and and lie about stuff and and I get that you don't want stolen valor and the military is going to come and attack that I get that but when you have blank accounts like this, which is what this was, that's where this guy you referred right. to started, and then there were other people who got involved after him. When you have blank accounts who people don't even know who they are, making up bullshit rumors, and then the whole internet runs with it, and then the military runs with it because the internet ran yeah. with it and eats their own, that pisses me off. And yeah. I had, when he first came in here, you know, he was on a roll doing his whole thing, and then I'm looking at him like, fuck, he's got to get to his plane. We weren't going to be able to address it. And so the episode obviously did really well, but I had a bunch of military guys reach out in the DMs about it. And I'm going to give them credit here because they were reaching out to rip him to shreds. And these were guys I could check who they were. They used their real name. Yeah. I could I could verify at least yeah. their background, stuff like that. So these, there were some real fucking people reaching out. I'm yeah. not just talking like some regular infantry people. And every person... I went right the fuck back at him. And I said, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? Have you checked into this? Did you see where that came from? And none of them had an answer for it. And to their credit, I didn't have anyone fight back on me on that. And they're like, oh, yeah. shit, I'm sorry. I should have checked that out. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to rip those guys. I appreciate them actually looking at that. But I'm like, damn, that's how fast that shit can spread. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. And, and like I said, you know, I, when I saw this going happen to Joe – I said, Joe, are you going to do anything? Yeah, I just, I'm not going to waste my time with this crap, you know. Yeah. I got and he didn't. And I said, that's a bad idea, man. Yeah. He's going to, the damage will be too severe when you try to recover. Right. And he lost a lot, man. But honestly, I know Joe. I've known Joe, man, since what, 2002, 2003, somewhere in that range, um, for a very long time. So 20 years, man. And um, I know Joe is when he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Yep. He gets it done. The guy, you know, he can back, he can walk the walk, talk to talk. He's never, you know, they, they try to beat him up for, you know, stolen valor. Well, you were never in combat, but you call yourself a combat vet. I'm like, well, he sees, <laughs> he's a ground he, he saw combat in, you know, in <laughs> Afghanistan. So was that make him a combat con contractor? Come on, you know, you know, stupid petty shit like oh. that. And sometimes I wonder, man, what are you guys thinking? You know, um, they're, they're so full of hate and jealousy. Yeah. And I, and I experience it too from time to time. I get, you know, I, I get, you do. I get people, everybody's trying to come along and blow out your candle, hoping there's burns brighter, you know? And, uh, it just, you know, I, I don't get it. And unfortunately, a lot of times in the military, that's what you get. You get a lot of haters, and uh, especially when you're successful. You know, when you're successful, you you know, you know the enemies come with that. And uh, and there's always someone out there that's gonna, you know, they, they got a hard on for you because whatever. You know, they think they're better than you, or they should have got something. They didn't get it. You know, they don't understand how you were successful. You know, whatever. Um, maybe that's just the human condition. You know, I just try to move on, ignore that stuff to to a point. Um, 
until you know it gets really personal and now I feel like maybe they're affecting my business or could affect my business or my welfare or my family's welfare then I have to push back and fight back but you mentioned stolen valor that's actually a big problem so this just happened to me in Bali this is kind of an interesting story so um my my a guy knows he says hey man I just met a marine lieutenant colonel retired he's he's Indonesian but he was in the US Marine Corps um came to the United States like age of five or something like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and he's here in Bali and, uh, and, and showed me his resume. I go, wow, pretty cool, man. The guy was infantry, you know, Marine Corps, Lieutenant Colonel, retired, all these things, you know, um, good English. And so we hired him for a couple of projects, you know, and then, you know, and I got him a job at this one place and he was supposed to help with uh, developing a security plan for a big New Year's Eve event. And, and I said, oh, you're in good hands. He's a lieutenant colonel. He knows all this stuff, all planning, blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you, you're good, you know. Well, that never materialized. And I'm like, and then the whole security plan went to shit on New Year's Eve. It was bad. It was disastrous. And I'm like, how did that happen? You got this guy, right? Well, this turns out this guy, I'll name his first name. His name is Chris. Um, turns out he was stolen by So things started not adding up after a while, right? And one of my friends that lives there is a former uh, Force Recon Marine. I'm really good guy. And he goes, this is not adding up. He goes, I don't believe the guy was Force Recon because I was Force Recon. He goes, I don't remember this guy. You know, no, 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 no. So um, so then I said, you know what, let me – so I checked with uh, – there's a couple of um, guys that do investigations, particularly in Stolen Valor, and I, they're on my internet. And I contacted them. I go, hey, can you look up this guy? They came back. Turns out the guy spent four months in the army, basic training, got kicked out for cause, um, mm. was a private. Um, he was in the engineers, uh, couldn't adjust to military life, whatever it was. And uh, so what he did is he photographed, uh, photoshopped his face on, you know, dress blues, you know, Lieutenant Colonel leaves and all that kind of stuff. He, the whole resume was bullshit, you know, but now he's got a job at a, with a client that I referred him to making really good money and he's supposed to be a security guy and the guy doesn't know anything about security which is obvious from the New Year's Eve event right and so I felt obligated to go to the owners of the company because they've been very gracious with me um, I, I'm their consultant they have my canines and all this stuff and I go this guy here is not who you think he is and I showed him the evidence and they were sitting on the fence because they're civilians and they're like we don't understand all this stuff I said, uh, I said bring him in and we'll ask ask questions. He goes, you ask the questions, me. So I'm going to ask the question. So he sits down and I go, I said, dude, I said, listen, you were a Lieutenant Colonel, right? Yes. Marine Corps. Yep. I said, what did you do? Oh, I was an infantry. I said, okay. What are the five paragraphs of an operations order? Everybody knows that. And it's mm. not, it's not uh, de branch dependent, right? Because we have to work together sometimes. And he goes, well, it's different for every I said, no, it's not different. I said, <laughs> what are the five paragraphs, right? And he couldn't answer it. I go, come on, dude. I said, I'll start with the first one. I'll give you a hint. Situation, right? And he couldn't, he couldn't work it out, right? And he kept, what are you asking me all these questions? What's going on here, right? He kept deflecting, right? And I told I, one of the, um, the owners earlier, I said, watch, he's a classic sociopath. I said, you will not get a rise out of this guy. He'll be very calm. His hands will be calm. Classic sociopath. And he was, dude. He was really stable. And I said, you know, just let me work on him, right? So we did that for a little bit. Nothing happened. Okay, he worked in, a, in, a, in the uh, uh, command and staff section, correct? And there's actually six levels, right? S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6, right? S1 being personnel, S2 intelligence, S3 is operations, S4 is logistics, uh, S5 civil affairs, and S6 signal. And uh, so I said, okay, so you're a staff officer how long? And, I, and he answered, and I said, so what staff section were you in? Which one? And what is it? He couldn't answer that question either, right? So I knew I had him by the balls. He had no idea. He didn't do his work. And um, so we went round and round for a little while. And then finally he goes, okay, okay. All right, I don't exist. And what is that? We're all like, what does that mean? He goes, I don't exist. He tried to pull the old, you know, the military, uh, you know, destroyed all my records and stuff because I was doing secret operations, oh, right? That shit. whole shit, right? And then he asked if I could ask for them to ask me to leave the room so he could talk to him in private. I say I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna humor him. I'm gonna step outside. This is gonna be funny. <laughs> then he's trying to tell me he's a secret agent. You know they ripped off all, all this I'm stuff. A totally you know, secret he, agent. He doesn't bro. exist. But it, he's got himself on LinkedIn and all these other social media sites with his dress blues on, yep. Colonel stuff. You know, and uh, you know so he just so right there I popped him right there on the spot and they fired him immediately. And See that's he, the stuff you do have to call out. Yeah, for sure. Well, because yes. he's making money a lot yes. of it, right? He's taking a job from somebody else that could have had that yep. job on using stolen valor. You know, and. Uh, 
uh, I've seen enough of these. I've seen so many of these guys. Um, they're everywhere. And I'm on the lookout for them. And you, can, you can't bullshit a bullshitter, you know. And I, things just started not adding up after a while. And I go, this guy is not who he says he is. And boom, there he is. And, and he, had a, he had a U.S. passport. And actually, technically, he could be deported because even though he's Indonesian, he doesn't have an Indonesian passport. He can only have one or the other, right? So, um, but he hightailed out of town really fast so we can catch him up with him and, uh, and have immigration handle him. But uh, they're Damn. everywhere. There's a lot of that going on, you know? And uh, people are out there making money, lying about their military service. And it's disgusting. It's sad. And uh, I have no tolerance for it, you know? I don't know why some people... I mean, I guess like some of the lower level guys who do it, like that example, like it's just typical fraudster doing their thing. But there's other people, I don't know why they feel like they have to embellish their stories that were already big. I mean, you, you talked about it. You you knew Chris Kyle back in yeah. the day, and obviously he's sadly passed away. That was really tragic. And, you know, a lot of people know his story as it's been told through Hollywood now. And yeah, the guy, I mean, I've talked to people like the guy legit was like a unbelievable sniper. That was all very real. But I, I think there were a couple different things. And, and one of them was it, it had nothing even to do with the battlefield, but like he went on and I've seen him tell the story. Maybe he did it on like Opie and Anthony or something. You can find the video of it, but he went on and told a story about like how he beat the shit out of, Jesse Ventura or something oh, yeah, like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which never happened. Right. And and Jesse's in like a tough spot because then the guy died and he's like a folk hero and everything. But Jesse was, right. I guess, righteously suing him before he died. And then years after he died, he he won the lawsuit. Yeah. And and I'm and it sucks because now the guy's got a widow and like yeah. oh my god, are you beating up on a like Jesse's in a lose lose. Right. But I see stuff like that and I wonder, I mean you can't ask Chris now, but I'm like, why did you why do you have to say that? You didn't no one would have given a shit if you hadn't beaten up Jesse Ventura. Like wh what do you think that is that some of these guys may, usually after their career obviously feel like they gotta oh I gotta tell people I did that. Yeah. Um a lot of weird things happen to you when you leave the service, particularly if you retire. You know, imagine this. If you're in special operations, you're three times more likely to die within two years than the average soldier. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because you're used to traveling 100 miles an hour every day, and all of a sudden you're in the civilian world doing three miles an hour. And so, you know, what happens? I've got a lot of friends that have committed suicide, drug overdoses. They start looking for that that had fixed that adrenaline, right? That they were so used to, they look for it. It's called um, it's called operator syndrome, right? Mm. Allostatic load. And so you're under this allostatic load for all these years. It becomes the norm. It's like being on drugs all these years, right? But a good drug, good high, for good reason. And all of a sudden that's gone. And now you're going, mm, I need a fix, you know? And so you get, you know, guys go down the wrong road sometimes. Sometimes it's drugs, sometimes it's alcohol uh, or some other, you know, adrenaline rush thing that they're going to do. Um, or they just get really sedentary and they just, you know, and they just, they just pass. You know, for me, um, I've never had a problem with drugs or felt suicidal or depression. Um, I always jokingly tell people I always go back to the well and take a drink because that's what kind of keeps my, it's my sanity, you know, so I do these other operations, singleton operations on my own, mm. like going and recovering people. Um, but it's so you're not never really all the way out in a way. You're never, I'm right. never really on the way out. Right. And right. It's, it's true. Um, my dad, you know, my dad was in the army. I remember he's in his fifties. Um, he looks at me one day, he goes, son, he goes, if the army would take me back today, he goes, I'd go back in a minute, you know? And I couldn't understand that. Like, why would you do that? You know, but now I understand it, right? Um, I wouldn't go back because hell, that'd be a hell of a pay cut. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and more not only that, you know, my liberty and everything. Personary else. business is a booming. Yeah. And so um, but I, I get it, right? Because as I started out in this in this in this program is you know, the military culture is so different from the civilian culture, man. It's almost hard to explain that, right? The the camaraderie, the brotherhood, you know. This is why I said when people talk about racism, I don't know what military they're talking about. You know, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's, I don't know. In combat arms, you're not going to find that, or very little of that. And um, so it's like the best it's almost like the best university to go to in the world. In fact, I used to recommend people go in the military all the time. It's like the best college in the world to go to, man. Um, the, you'll meet the best people, the best friendships. 
And so you get used to that, and suddenly you're in this other weird world where you're around weird people that lie, embellish, pretend to be who they're not, you know. Um, and it feels very unusual. And so you naturally want to gravitate back to that culture that you grew into, right? But you can't because they won't take you back because you're like me. You're like too old. Um, and so you look for that. You look for something to fill that gap, that emotional gap, you know. And for me, it's, mm. you know, I like to do, I still like to do scary, dangerous, risky things, but for the right reasons, for good reasons. Um, and so every now and then, yeah, you know, I get the phone call, hey, man, um, would you like to go hunt some terrorists? Oh, yeah, how long? For a couple of weeks, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, you know. <laughs> uh, but I need to be back to, for, you know, this, when I get back for a podcast. Oh, okay. Oh <laughs> or, can I do the po or can I do the podcast downrange? Oh, you can do that down. Okay, cool. Um, oh, my God. But no, it's it's like that, you know. And um, you never get enough of it because for me personally, I feel like it's part of my DNA. I was grown, raised in that type of uh, culture. I, as soon as I graduated high school, I went back into that culture. After I retired the military, I got back into the culture anyways. I'm always trying to keep my hand on it a little bit somewhere. I mean, I'm trying to stay in that culture because it, it grounds me and it's a, it's a familiar place that kind of helps me keep my sanity in an insane rule, you know? Hey guys, it's come to my attention that many of you are unaware that we have multiple other channels on YouTube and have for a while in at least two cases. So the first channel is at Julian Dory Clips, which we've been posting on for over a year. It has mid-form clips and short-form clips going out every single day, and it is huge to help us in the algorithm when those clips do well. So please go over there and subscribe. The link is in the description. The second page is at Julian Dory Daily, which is a brand new page with different editors posting exclusive content that is also mid-form and short-form clips. That link is in the description. And finally, we have a page called Best of JDP, which we put on ice for a while, but we just hired another editor to bring back. It is a shorts-only page. He will be making shorts exclusively for that channel. Once again, the link is in the description. You can check out all three down there in the description, and I hope to see you guys subscribe. Thank you. And, um, and so a lot of guys, you know, I think that's what happens. So they either go down the wrong road, drugs, alcohol, other weird yeah. stuff, get in trouble, or they go suicidal, or, you know, they just become depressed, or they just, you know, just fade away. Um, they talk about the days, you know, of glory. A lot of guys are defined by who they were and not who they are today. And, mm. and by the way, I don't, I never, I don't, I never go around telling people that, you know, I'm a former Delta Force operator. I don't define myself for that. I define myself as who I am today. Um, that's all that matters. Being a Delta Force operator, being a Green Beret, being all the things I've done in the past were just stepping stones to where I'm at today. Where am I? What am I today? I'm a businessman. I'm a life coach. I'm a father. I'm a husband. You know, I've got a, I'm, I, I got a PhD. Um, oh, you got a PhD? Yeah, you know that? No. <laughs> Surprise. I got That's awesome. Yeah, I got, a, I got a doctorate in uh, alternative medicine and natural health. I got a master's degree in business and organizational security management. Um, I speak several languages. I can go on and on and on. But I, um, that's who I am today. Um, everything else was behind me. I never looked back. Um, you know, I look out the windshield, not through the rearview mirror. And, mm. uh, you know, there's a lot more to see to the front that I want to do. And, um, and, I'm, and, and that's, you know... That's how I see myself. And so I don't live with regrets. Um, you know, I'm, it, there's, there's been things that have happened to me in the past that were, you know, I didn't really, I wish it never did happen, but they happened. And I don't dwell on them. I don't look back. I don't let You've it never struggled me. with that at all? You never had any battles with PTSD? Yeah, or? actually, I, yeah, actually I had. Um, oh, you have? Yeah. And I don't, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say that because- You uh, shouldn't be. You know, PTSD is not- you know, my PTSD, I, I think Joe mentioned it. Um, he talked about like what happened with uh, um, Mike Donatelli Mike, on Discovery yeah. Channel, right? That mm -hmm. Mike died in my arms that night. Um, I was the oh, guy. that's right. You were there. Yeah, I was the guy out there, you know, when all that happened uh, by myself. And, um, you know, things like that, when things like that happen, you know, that has a pretty profound effect on you. What I suffered from there was survivor's guilt because – Joe and I, I mean, Joe, but Mike and I had switched places the last, very, very last second. And Mike got on the helicopter instead of me. And when I, I watched the helicopter crash that morning, 3.30. And I remember running down there by myself, 
nobody, nobody to help me. And uh, when I found everybody, the bodies, you know, it was a pretty gruesome sight. Um, and Mike was the only one to have survived, but barely. And oh, he survived on the crash. I didn't know that. Yeah, his, and I, I can say that because I've already told that to his parents, his father, right? Because originally his father thought he died instantly, and this might be an interesting story to share with everybody. Uh, I think it is. I think it might be important as well. So I'll just kind of give you a little bit of the background. So J Mike was a Green Beret Del um, Ranger. He was in Delta Forces, uh, operations manager. Not a, I'm not an operator, but uh, still doesn't matter. He and I had a lot in common. I was a professional boxer. He was a Golden Gloves boxer. We both had, you know, Hispanic wives. We had the same number of kids, same age. There was a lot of similarities between us, you know. And uh, and so we're doing this show, Discovery Channel. You know, we're actually all co-producers along with Joe. And then uh, we made that decision um, that fateful night that uh, we would change positions. I would be on the ground narrating the scene. Mike would get in the helicopter. He would just drop the rucksack. That would have been, that was my job at first, but we thought for the betterment of the show, it would be best to do it this way. Um, because I have a uh, background in um, high-speed and technical driving, off-road yeah. driving, things like that, right? So, and this jo was and jo Joe was saying the same. Joe was saying the same thing. It's like it could have been me in there. Like it was like this. Yeah. It was just random. That <clears throat> you were you guys were on the ground. Yeah. So, um, so what happened? You know, I go down there. I do. I do what I can do. You know, I find Mike. I'm, you know, he's unconscious. He's barely breathing. Um, he's a mess. He's alive, but he's a mess. And uh, this is a really eerie story because I'd already found the pilot earlier. Um, he had been decapitated, and oh. so I moved on, looked around, found Mike laying there. And if you could just imagine, it's 29 degrees out right now. It's in the desert. There's no illumination, no moonlight. I'm wearing a coal miner's light on my helmet i mean my on my head it's all i got to see with i have a thin jacket on it's very cold because i wasn't expecting to be out there that long and uh, i'm soaking wet with jet fuel uh, from the knees down because as i was running through the sagebrush you know the the fuel tank apparently had ruptured when this thing just literally disintegrated there was nothing bigger than a shoe box left in this helicopter and so jet fuel had been doused everywhere as i'm running through i'm soaked in it i find mike and uh you know, he's he's not doing well. And I ended up grabbing him by his torso. He was wearing like a brown fleece jacket. And I had to roll him to his side to clear his airway because he was choking on his blood, teeth, all kinds of stuff. And um, and when I did, man, it's like, one, one, it felt like I was rolling a bag of potatoes. But two, he was soaking wet in jet fuel. My gloves were soaking wet, jet fuel, blood, whatever. And then, so I'm trying to manage his airway. And I still have a third guy that I'm looking for, the uh, the cameraman. I know he's out here somewhere. I don't know where because, you know. Anyways, as I'm sitting there, I'm trying to control Mike. There's no help coming. I don't see anybody coming. I don't hear anybody coming. I'm in the middle of this desert. And I remember yelling out really loud, I've got two. I'm missing one. I need some help. Those are my words. I said that a couple of times, hoping somebody would hear me and dial in and come to me and help me. And so... This is when the weird thing happened. So next thing I know, out of the open desert, the open desert, I see a woman approaching me at a brisk pace. She walks right past me within arm's reach, easily. Doesn't say a word, doesn't stop, doesn't do anything. Walks right behind, walks behind me. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm trying to hang on the mic so he don't roll over, and I'm trying to turn around to look, and I can't really see her yet, and I hear her gasp. And she turns around and briskly walks right past me back out into the open desert where she came from. What? And I thought, that is some weird shit. So I, tur I turned around and looked at her, What is she gasping about? And I looked back and there's the cameraman. So I balanced Mike as best I could on his side. And I, you know, I reassured him, hoping that maybe he could hear me. Um, I said, Mike, I'll be right back, brother. I said, I got one more man I got to check on, but I'll be right back. You're going to be okay. So I get up. I run back. 15 feet, something like that. A little I know he's right behind me and he's laying on his back. He had basically been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically been halved by the fuselage, went up between his legs. And oh. it, so he was dead, right? So it didn't take me long to figure that the out. Cameraman. Yeah. So I run back and I'm still managing Mike, but he's slowly, he's slowly slipping away. And probably within 30 seconds, you know, 
we're about five minutes into this thing right now. He's he's gone. And uh, then the first medic slides into home base with the aid back, you know, like, do what you got to do, but it's over, you know. So anyways, that's kind of the event, <clears throat> some other things that transpired. But one of the things, and so I, when I talk about my coaching, I do a lot of coaching, right? And I talk about stress management and the leadership, uh, self-governance and things like that. One of the things that happened was as the sun started coming up, all of a sudden now the highway patrol showing up, the fire department, um, the FAA, oh my God, man, like, like 50 cars showed up, right? And they're all getting out and the fire marshal gets out, he's an older guy, and, uh, and he walks over to the pilot who I had covered up his torso uh, with something I can't remember it was like a white piece of styrofoam or something because no need to look at a guy laying without his head on right so um, and he just loses his shit he's like who did this who put that and he's going crazy man and uh, and then he, he's now he's screaming and he's literally crying he's coming he's very hysterical and I, what the hell? This is a fire marshal. He's pretty senior, and he's losing his shit out here right in front of everybody. And he's really yelling and barking orders. And, and I run, I finally just looked at him and go, hey, shut the F up. I said, if you can't compose yourself and do your job, get the freak out of here. I said, you're not helping the situation. You're hurrying. Right? And I pretty much had to fire him up to get him to come back to, you know, sanity um, and get him back, you know, get him back in the right mindset. But um you would think a senior fire marshal has seen worse than that. Yeah. But, you know, but anyways, he just really came un, unhinged. Um, finally, what happened was, so there's a big investigation, blah, 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 blah. Somebody made a mistake. Of, well, they wasn't a mistake. They were trying to be kind to his parents and say, hey, he died instantly, um, which was not true. Um, so... <clears throat> So I wrote the book. I already had written my book, American Badass. I was almost complete with it. And I thought, you know, this would be a good chapter to start the, the story with, not because it's a glory story, but I thought there was a lot of uh, things that we could learn from the story about, you know, for example, when I found the pilot, I saw him in the distance, right? I remember, it's really dark. And I see him laying, what looked like he was face down, head towards me. I run over to him. I grab him by his shoulders and I roll him over. And when I roll him over, I realize he doesn't have a head. Mm. And it caught me by complete surprise, right? And I kind of stood up and gasped. And I was stunned because that's not what I was expecting. Um, and I remember, remember I talked about my OTC instructor, Mad Max earlier, right? Mad Max, he was really hard, but he did it because he loved us and he wanted us to live, right? And he used to always tell us, don't run the situation. Let the, he said, don't let the situation run you. You run the situation, right? Run the situation. Don't let it run you. Um, and then he, the other thing you always tell is do something, God damn it. Even if it's wrong, just do something. But don't stand there, right? And I remember when I rolled him over, I was kind of like stood up in kind of shock. I remember those words coming across my mind, you know, run the situation. Don't let it run you. you got to con continue on, right? C continue mission. Charlie, Mike, you got two more guys out here. So that's what helped me compose myself again. And, um, and so I went back to work, you know, rather than standing going, you know, uh, what happened? It was like a nightmare. And it was, I mean, think about it. It's dark, right. you know, and it's cold and it's just, fuck, you know, it's crazy. So I thought I'd open the story because there are a lot of other lessons learned in that thing, right? That I thought people should know and understand, you know, when it comes to self-leadership, um, governance and, uh, and encourage and things like that, you know. Um, so when I wrote the story, I mentioned somebody survived. I didn't mention who. I said, yeah, one guy was alive, you know, blah, 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 but this is what happened. Well, maybe a week later, um, I'm still in L.A. with my management team, investigation still going on. I get a phone call from his wife, Mike's wife, and uh, she's got me on speakerphone, apparently with the lawyers, and they start asking all the questions. Who made the decision to change seats, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you know what? I said, that was a group decision um, for the Betterment Show. You know, we all had equal authority. We're all co-producers, you know, nothing nefarious going on there, right? So now we're thinking, okay, the lawyers are going to try to sue everybody, looking for all the pockets, right, to put their hands in, including mine. And I think, uh, now what did I get into? Um, and then about two months later, I'm back in LA. I'm in the gym working out one day. I get a call from her again. And she's like, hey, Dale, in July, we're going to have a... Um, uh, a 
a birthday party for Mike, a celebratory birthday party for his life, you know, and it's his birthday, you know, in memory of Mike, you know, a memorial, and we would like for you to come to that. It's in Pennsylvania. And so I'm like, well, how can I say no, right? And I said, of course I'll come there, right? So, so that day comes. It's a beautiful sunny day in Pennsylvania, you know, green pastures. I still remember that day. I land, I get in a rental car, I drive a while, I finally get to the location, and his wife was Cuban, and Mike was Italian. So when I got to the location, imagine all the Cuban side of the family and the Italian side of the family all come together. They got a circus tent out in this open pasture. They've got bands playing, a big memorial for Mike, you know. Um, like there are probably 500 people there, you know, jumping around, kids playing, just a lot of activity. I mean, it's like a... I don't know, man. It was like a carnival, right? So I pull up, and there's cars parked everywhere, and I find one open parking spot. It just happens to be right there in front of everybody. And I thought, did they reserve that for me? Because I was late getting there. And so I remember sitting in the car. I turned it off. I'm looking at all this going on, and I'm, I got, you know, I was very nervous, um, filled with trepidation because I'm thinking, I don't know, is this an ambush? I don't know what's happening here right now, right? And uh, what am I doing here, you know? And and so I had to reach deep down and go, you know what? You have an obligation, man. Go out there. You have a responsibility to the family and face the music. Whatever happens, happens. Just deal with it. So I get out of the car, and I'm walking across this open pasture, probably 200 yards across, and then everything stopped. All the activities stopped. Everybody's facing me. And I'm, as I'm walking towards and they're all, just music, everything stops. I'm like, holy shit. And then the father comes out and he walks out in the open field and meets me halfway. And it reminds me of the movie um, Braveheart, right? The, mm. the two armies lined up in the field yeah. and the leadership walks out in the center. <laughs> yeah. You know, they have a parlay. And, uh, and the father walks out and I've never met him before. And so I get out there, we stop. And the first question, the first thing that was uttered was from him. And he asked me, he goes, I have a question to ask you. He goes, the person that survived the crash, was that my son? Now I'm like, damn, do I lie or do I tell the truth? And I thought, you know what? Out of respect for him, I'm going to tell the truth and respect for myself, you know, um, because I sure hate to lie. And then later on, he finds the truth for whatever reason, right? So I said, yes, sir. I said, your, your son... You know, he, he didn't die instantly. He died in my arms. Um, literally, I held him. I did everything I could for him that, that morning, you know. And uh, I'm sorry to say that. And uh, he looked at me. He shook my hand. He hugged me. He goes, you know what? He goes, he goes if there's anybody I wanted to be, to be with my son on the way out, it was you. He goes, I thank you for being there for him. He goes, I want to welcome you to my family. Consider yourself a part of this family. Wow. And then as I... Turned around and walked with it. All of a sudden, everybody comes out. They got my book, American Badass. They all want autographs and stuff. You know, it's crazy, right? And, and yeah, and suddenly, you know, it wasn't like a solemn affair. It was a festive affair, celebratory about Mike's life, you know. And we sat around bonfires at night talking and, you know, and I really felt like, you know, I'm welcome here, you know. And I didn't think, okay, this is not going to be a torture session. I'm not going to get ambushed or killed or, or anything like that. You know, I felt like, you know. They appreciated that, one, I had the balls to show up, and two, to, you know, be honest about, you know, what happened with Mike, you know. And three, they they were happy that he didn't die alone, so to speak, you know. And um, so that's in the book, by the way. That's in the, in the, in, in the first part of the book. But uh, there's, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that, I feel like, you know. And, and when you – we started out this conversation, this mm -hmm. segment of the converse, conversation about, you know, PTSD. PTSD. So that was one of those things. It took me years to get over um, survivor's guilt. Like, literally, I would wake up every morning, and I had a cement truck parked on my chest. That's the first thing I thought about, Mike, you know? And why him, not me? Because I remember standing there looking at him that night, just standing there, before the medic even rolls, comes sliding in. And I'm thinking, that's supposed to be me. That should have been me. You know, that's a hard pill to swallow, you know? When you realize that man just died in your stead, you know? simple decision and he ends up you know laying there instead of me and i thought man you know how do you how do you how am i going to cope with that and it took a couple years literally every morning waking up with a cement truck parked on my chest you know and it's a bad way to start the day um 
it, it has a negative impact on your physiology, psychology, um, everything. Your performance is really hindered by that. And I knew that. I knew how to get over it and move on. And why do I have survivor's guilt? Because I'm a moral person. I'm a good person, okay? Um, and I felt like, you know what? I don't want to see people die for nothing. And I felt like in this case, I should have been dead, not him, you know? Um, because now his family's here without him. And his little boy was only about two years old. I don't even think the boy even understood what was going on. I remember that. It's like, oh, my God, you know? And uh, and so I, I vowed, I, I got some help, you know? And really the help was nothing more than me just talking about it like I am to you. And when you talk about something like this, what ends up happening, you arrive at your own answers and conclusions, right? You just sort it out. And that's what I needed. I need a sounding board. They didn't, the psychiatrist didn't guide me. He would just ask me a question. Well, how do you feel about that? And I thought mm -hmm. about it and I'd answer the question. And I go, yeah, I, that's how I kind of worked through it. Um, but uh, I vowed that moving forward from that day on, I would do the best that I could and be the best person I can be um, in honor of Mike. And particularly, I don't want his family ever to look at me and go, what a shit bag. You know, this guy gets to live and my husband's dead. He's a total turd. Um, I don't ever want them to think that. I want them to know that I'm a good person. I'm going to do righteous things, mm. good, good, good things for people. Um, and, and in honor of, of him and his son and his wife. So, um, you know, my, 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 you know, I, I think Joe may have talked about this before, you know, PTSD. Look, I have no problem sleeping at night for the many guys I let the air out of. Um, you know, they had it coming. It was either them or it was me. Um, Just say let the air out of? Yeah. That's a know, good one. It's a nice way to put it, I might it, right? use that. It's a nice way to put it. Yeah. You know, instead okay. of make, making them leak or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> leak to death. <laughs> you know, let them deflate, you know. But anyways, um, I don't lose sleep over that, man, because I know what I did was righteous. Um, it's righteous, you know. And um, these are the same people that, shit, man, you know, they're brutal, man, what they've done to people. And so I have no problem with that. Um the, the part that always hurts, man, and I think maybe I'm not, I'm speaking for myself, but I imagine that it's probably true for a lot of uh, combat veterans is the hard part is when you see innocent women and children yes. hurt or killed, right? That was always the hardest part, man. When you go into a room, you know, and you got three or four women huddled up in the corner with their ba babies and women, kids screaming, you know, in horror and terror because you're coming in the house with guns and you're going after their fathers, their brothers, their uncles who are bad guys, you know. And and these son of a bitch has put their families in harm's way like that, you yeah. know. And you, But you hear them screaming. All you can think about is your own children, you know, your own family. What if that was my family? It's heartbreaking, you know. Um, I remember I had to do a... Um, I had to do what's called a CTR, a close target reconnaissance. So it was broad daylight. It was in Tikrit, Sodom's uh, hometown. Um, there was a strike force lined up, and we're going to hit this one particular target in this neighborhood, which is a, a bad neighborhood. My job was to go in, dressed up as an Iraqi, blend in, in a pickup truck. You was an Iraqi? Yeah, I had to dress up as one. I looked. I had to look one. I had to blend in. If I don't, I'm gonna get killed, right? Yeah, I don't know if you're blending in though. Well, no, no, no. Actually, at one time, I actually had hair and I had a beard. I looked like I really did look like an Arab. Really? Yeah, black beard and everything. Uh, I've, my face was much <laughs> slender. Uh, yeah, I got pictures of it. It's pretty crazy, right? And uh, so I drive in and I, I PID was called PID, positively identify the residents, and which is hard to tell because all the homes are connected, right? It's just one long row houses mm. and compounds and walls. But I PID the car, his car, location. Okay, there it is. That's that's that. I just got to remember exactly where it's at because I'm going to go back out, and I'm I'm going to bring the uh, the assault element inside. They're going to follow me in, right? And I'm going to direct them to the target. And so I find PID it. I go out. I link up with the uh, the main body. I go, okay, guys, I got it. PID ready to go. Roger that. Follow me. And we here comes the cavalry, <laughs> and we go rolling through the neighborhood and go rolling down the street where the where the target was. And I'll be damned, the car was missing now. Like, shit. And, uh, and all the houses look alike. And I was like, it's got to be this one here. I'm pretty close, right? And so I hit, just hit the brakes. And it was I was right. I got the right house. Even though the car wasn't there. And the assaulters all get out. They're running into the compound. And there's a little kid standing outside, about two years old, little Iraqi kid, you know. And uh, he was doing something. He had a ball in his hand or something. Little cute little kid, man. I still remember. And when he sees all these assaulters barging into the compound, coming after his dad, 
right? Um, he just lost his shit in the street. And uh, I'm out of the vehicle. I got my, my weapon in my hand. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure any minute now, you know, we're going to have the, you know, the horde come down on top of us. You know, it's going to be ugly. And uh, this little kid standing there screaming. But I'm trying to pull security, for, you know, up the street because the guys are behind me going in. And I see this kid. And all I can think about is my own son. Mm. Right? I remember yeah. my son when he was two years old. Same height and everything, you know? And... My son, by the way, he's 36 now. He's a Green Beret. He's a Ranger. Um, follow my footsteps. That's awesome. And so my the father in me just ran over, and I picked this kid up in my arm, you know, and I'm holding him. I got armor on. Got my weapon and my long gun in my right hand. I'm holding my left hand. I'm like, it's okay, little buddy. Everything's going to be okay, you know. And, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure he understood me or not, but I'm thinking, the fuck, we're going to go in there. They might just kill his dad right now. You know, I don't know what they're going to do. It depends on what kind of fight he puts up, you know, and I got to hold this little kid, you know. But it's those kind of things that you never forget because you can directly relate to them because if oh, yeah. you have kids, you know, and family, there, there it is, right? And those are the hardest things to, uh, to forget and overcome, and they stay with you for a very long time, if not forever. Um, you can see I can still remember it in great detail because – you know, um, our, our memory, our long-term memory is, is, you know, is based on emotion. The more emotional yes. event it is, the longer you remember it, right, in better detail. And I can remember that. Like, it just happened, you know. And, uh, you know, a little kid ball, bulling, bawling and snot coming out of his nose. He's screaming and, you know, and, God, he's not even my kid, but he's, he is like my kid, you know. And, and I got a job to do. And, you know, what if I got to fight, you know. It's, it's just crazy, right. Um, these are decisions sometimes – we have to make, you know, in combat. And sometimes I think that's hard for people to appreciate. Um, they see the movies, but they don't really see. They don't oh, they can't replicate that. You can't. And you can't no. really, you can't see into a man's heart. Right. You know, what's going through his mind at that moment in time and, and the emotion. Look, we're not heartless, murdering, you know, I use the term psychopathic killers. You know, at the end of the day, you know, just like I told BBC, you know, I said, my, you know, the guys that were on my strike team, you know, doing the mercenary work. I said, you know what we are? I said, we're professionals. We're fathers. We're husbands. You know, we're men of moral character. You know, we're, we're, we're good guys, you know, going after the evil that's in this world. We're not the bad guys, you know, because they try to compare us to the Wagner group, which are a bunch of criminals. Literally, they're criminals right out of the prison, hired to be uh, mercenaries. Um, and I try to explain that to people. It's like, just because I'm a warrior um, doesn't mean I'm an evil person. It doesn't mean I'm a murderer. Um, I'm the one, you know, if you, if you could read my tattoo, you know, I'm the horrible thing standing before the temple, the stone fried uh, above the uh, cathedral doors. I'm the dreadful spirit summoned, not recorded. I'm the necessary hour um, that you, once I arrive, you want me gone, right? I'm, you never need a soldier until you need a soldier. And then mm -hmm. after you use it, you want us out of there, right? Um, we're despicable in a lot of people's eyes. And, it is what it is, you know. At the end of the day, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy doing the the righteous things. I believe I'm doing, you know. Do you ever think about, you know, and this isn't a you problem. This is a, this is a general problem that war creates. I don't, if mm. I knew how to solve this, trust me, we wouldn't be sitting in a podcast right now. But do you ever think about the effects that it has on those innocents around there. I mean, there was a story, and I really got to go check this because this is like the third time this has come up on a podcast, and I, I can't remember whose it was. But I know my buddy Ryan Tate, who was a Marine chasing out of in Iraq, when he was in here, he told a story about these kids during the door-to-doors. And what I can't remember if this is one of his door-to-doors because he used to do that when they were going through Iraq after the invasion. They mm -hmm. had to go door-to-door -door and, and find people. Or if it was a story that General McChrystal told about another door-to-door. -door. Either way, the point remains. And the story goes when the soldiers went in there, whether it was Ryan or some of the other soldiers, can't remember. But when they went into one of these homes, there was this like seven-year-old kid or something like that. And he just looked at them with just dead behind the eyes eyes not like lights are on no one's home just like oh it's just what it is and he proceeded to get down on the ground and put his hands over his head and lay down prone with it with his face down and they were you know he didn't speak english but they were going over going no 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 no, we don't need you to do that and he let and they like pulled him up and he just looked at him like dead to the eyes again and they're like get out of the house or whatever and and, and he like walked outside as if 
you know, cool customers. If nothing's going on, this is just another day in my life. And the way Ryan explained it was, the fuck you think that kid's going to think us when he grows up? You know, we're there doing a job. We're not bad people. We were told to do this job. There's a lot of shit going down. Zakar, we, Al Zakar, we, recruiting all these people to be terrorists they're unfortunately hiding among the populace we're trying to stop all these bombs and ieds from going off we're trying to save not just american lives but iraqi lives but we are the big bad you know metagons coming in there knocking down doors doing our jobs and these kids look at us and the image they see is horror yeah they see these are the these are the these are the ter- and that's not what it is but that's what they think cuz they're young and that's what they think it is these are the terrorists invading our country yeah. and then that kid grows up and I'm not excusing what he does by the way I want to be right, very right. clear yeah. about that like you reach certain ages like you make decisions right? right but I try to look at the root cause and say well how can we fix that in the future because that kid grows up he's 22 and he's a terrorist and he wants to blow people up well actually you know it's been my experience and I know that the guys I go went out with, the things we used to do, we actually would go out of our way to console and comfort mm. children. We would actually bring candy, you know, um, anything, you know, we would segregate them with their mom, keep them together. Here's some candy, you know. We tried very hard to show them we're not the bad guy. And in fact, we tried to show their the elders or whoever were going to roll up if we didn't kill them, respect and restraint, especially in front of the family. We never tried to abuse them in front of their family, right? And we actually never really tried to abuse anybody. Um, you know, I, and I found, for example, one time we had this kid, his dad was a general and involved in a lot of bad shit. We had rolled them both up. The kid was actually 18, um, but he's still a kid. He was young. And he was just mortified we had him handcuffed you know gagged in the back room he's laying on the floor you know while his dad's out there getting you know the third degree and i, I looked at him he's laying there kind of shivering and i'm like you know what i walked in there i, I set him up took his you know his gag out of his mouth gave him some water pat him on the shoulder and told him it's gonna be okay you know and so i tried to do that you know um you know I, I went that far, and a lot of guys did. So, you know, let's, you know, there's still the human side of us, right? Um, you know, I can do a lot of damage, but I can also be a very, you know, humane person as well. And I get it, man, because I have my own children. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a monster. None of these guys are. And, uh, you know, there's scenarios like that where, you know, you find, hey, you know what? Yeah, you're you're under suspicion right now. You know, we got we arrested you. We think you did bad things along with your dad. I see you're scared. I see the fear in your eyes. You know, maybe that's a good thing. But I also want you to know that uh, you know, my heart says, in my heart, I believe that you're probably innocent. And uh, you know, here, have a drink of water, take a breath. You know, and then we'll let the games begin again. You know, take a break for a minute. So I try to, <laughs> so I try to change. I try to change the. You know, like you know, show him there's he doesn't have to. He has to not necessarily be in fear for his life. It's just, you know, be respectful, do the right thing. And if you didn't do anything wrong, don't worry. You know, um, we're human and we'll hopefully recognize that you're a good person and nothing will happen to you. Or we'll recognize you're a fucking bad guy and yeah, bad things are going to happen to you. Um, but it's hard to deal with a lot of stuff, man. I was in Afghanistan. So um, I remember every morning, not every morning, but every third morning, Around 4.30, when the Taliban and others would go to prayer call, right? They always pray at 4.30. Sun was up. And uh, it was like on the way to prayer call, they would go, hey, let's drop a couple of mortars on the Americans, right? And so the mortar assault attacks would start. And then I have to get out of bed, you know, call, come over to radio, incoming, shit. And I throw my shit on, run out of mortar pit, you know, and we dial in the mortars, return fire, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I kind of – and then we had uh, an OP – uh, um, observation post, basically a small encampment on the top of the hill. And there was probably 25, 30 of our guys in there, um, Afghans, you know, they're sandbagged in there and they lived up there and their job was to pull surveillance of the entire valley. They're on the highest point, right? And they're covering us we're below them about three, 4,000 feet. The total elevation was about 9,000 feet. And so what was happening on the backside of the mountain, there was a village uh, below Taliban were hanging out there, right? And they would come up the backside and then they would snipe and attack our OP up there. And they'd take out some of the guys and then they'd go back down the mountain, back to the village. And it started becoming problematic. And I started getting a little frustrated about it. And I thought, you know, all right, I'm done with this shit. So I took my, one of my patrols 
And I said, let's go up there. We went up and I went over to the side of the mountain where these guys are coming up. And I kind of figured out, okay, which trails are they coming up? They're coming up here, they're coming up there. They're using this trail, they're sneaking up to this point and they're shooting from this position, RPGs, uh, SVDs, sniper rifles. I said, okay, I'm going to ambush. I'm going to set them up with booby traps. So the next time they crawl through here, blow themselves up. So I started putting in booby traps, um, started mining the area with uh, hand grenades, trip wires, things like that. And uh, got it all set up pretty. And only I'm the only one who knew what those things were. I kept my patrol back. Um, I didn't want them walking around in there and set one of these things off and kill us all. So I managed all that. And then we left. Um, I had to go back to the U S like a couple of days later. And so I leave, I'm gone for 30 days. I come back, my cohort, my, my partner, um, was, was still there. And by the way, he committed suicide. He was a former Green Beret mm -hmm. also it's just the pressure. One day he just killed himself in his front yard in, uh, in Southern Pines, North Carolina, but great guy. What a great guy, man. He was just always laughing. It's just good. Never saw that coming either, man. And, uh, but he was still there at the time. And I say, Hey dude, so, you know, he's briefing me when I show up, I go, how's everything, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, by the way, you know, how about booby traps work, you know, getting the Taliban. He goes, yeah, well, you got two kills. I go, really? He goes, yeah, you killed a goat. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he goes, and you killed a 13 year old kid. I'm like, huh? And what happened was, all right, so what happened was there was another attack by the Taliban. This time they called in 155 artillery strike, right, Americans. And they bombed the shit out of this, this whole area, which was where all my booby traps were, right? So it's a big mess. And after it was over, this father said, I'm going to send my 13-year-old kid up there to, to uh, recover spent brass, you know, unexploded ordinance because what they do is they salvage it, you know, and they sell it, you yeah, know, yeah. whatever, right? That's how they make their money. It's very poor. So he sends the kid up there and the kid's walking around, walks through one of my booby traps and kills himself, right? In my booby trap. And, uh, and then he sends a second son up there, a little bit younger. He goes and blows his leg off right in one of my booby traps. And so they actually found, uh, one of the boys in a garbage dump down at, in our, in our base camp. And I was like, what the frick, you know? And, uh, really crazy, right? Some, and so I'm trying to get my head around this whole thing. And I, now I have to question myself, you know, was it all worth it? You know, I put the booby traps up because I'm trying to save these men who also have families that are being sniped, you know, from Taliban. And so what ended up happening was I ended up, you know, getting a couple of kids hurt and killed, right? Trying to protect these men who also have kids. And uh, it was a dilemma, right? It's a real moral dilemma at oh, that yeah. point, an ethical dilemma. I was like, what do I do, you know? And so when I found out about the artillery strike, I went up there and took a look, and it was just a mess. I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to take all this out, and uh, that's it. So now I got a problem because now I'm, I got to walk out there and find these booby traps, and it's, the terrain doesn't even look like the same anymore from the ar artillery strike. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I found, I actually found one hand grenade barely hanging from a tree with tripwire on it. I mean, I made a comment in my book about, you know, all it took was a bird to fart and this thing would have blown up in my face, you know? So I'm, I'm up there sneaking up on grenades and stuff and grabbing them and then throwing them down the side of the mountain towards the Taliban, you know? And I, I, I finally clear the area. Um, but, you know, that's one of those things, again, where you, you look back and you ask yourself, what was the right answer? You know, that's a hard one because, okay, yeah. kids dead, kids maimed, but soldiers are dead, soldiers are maimed, they got kids, you know, it's, that's a hard one. You know, that's a really hard one to get your head around. Those are the kind of things that stick with you. Not shooting somebody and watching a bad guy die, you know, that doesn't bother most soldiers. Um, it's the, it's the collateral damage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, I feel you. And so. Did you ever did so it, it sounds like though you never anybody you ever purposely pulled the trigger on, you never had any second guesses about any of those. You always were pretty comfortable. All right. Yeah. I, I know who this dude is. Yeah, absolutely, man. You yeah. know, look oh, that's good. I mean, you know who you're fighting. And when it's coming at you with a weapon, it's like okay. Easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Easy peasy, you know. Um but you know, it's the collateral damage, like you said, you know, the 
the, the bodies, the kids, the women, you know, the screaming, you know, and the, and the identity is like, ah, oh, man, it's like my own, my own family, right. you know, and you start relating to that, you know, and it's like, ah, it just really becomes overwhelming. That's the part that you carry with you for a very long time. And uh, the horror that goes with that, that's more terrible than killing bad guys, you know. That's, that's worse than actually fighting for your own life, honestly. Um, that's scarier and more horrifying than me actually getting along with a bad guy and it's going to be me or him, mm. you know, that part. Because that, re- that relates to a whole different level, you know, uh, you know, my heart, my emotional being. It's like, you know, because my family is what matters, you know. I don't matter. To this bad guy, I don't give a shit. If he kills me, I kill him. You know, we're both going to die doing what we we signed up to do. But it's all the other people that didn't sign up for it. That's who you, you know, you you feel bad for. Um, but you know, you move on. Um, I don't. You, you know, I, I've learned to cope with stuff like that. You have to. Um, if you don't, man, it'll eat you up. You know, and some people it does, and they can't cope with it, and they kill themselves. You know, just lost another Delta operator not too long ago, committed suicide. Mm. Sorry um, to hear that. Yeah, you know, and and um, Green Berets. You know, uh, I've known a lot of guys have they've just off themselves. They just couldn't cope with things anymore. Um, you know, on one, you can't blame them. Go well, you signed up for it. You know what? <laughs> You better be damn glad somebody signed up for it because if your yeah. ass didn't sign up for it, you shut the fuck up, right? Is what I say. Oh, yeah. You know, so, yeah. you know, because what we're doing fuck is. Fuck anyone who says that. Yeah. yeah. We're here, you know, we're doing a job, man. And uh, it's not just a job. It's when people come up to me and ask, and like it happened this morning at the airport, you know, guy was, hey, thank you for your service. And I'm like, no, you know what? Thank you and thank America for giving me the opportunity to fight for this country. I look mm. at it as a privilege, all right? You know, you don't have to thank me for that shit. I'm honored that I'm allowed to do this, right? I look at it differently, you know? Um, I don't need you, you know, patting me on my back going, good, thanks a lot for being courageous. I'm not courageous, man. I'm confident, okay? That's mm. the difference, right? And so, you know, and I always tell people there's three types, man. There's, you know, there's the guy that's fearless who's too dumb to realize he's in trouble and does it anyways. When we were teenagers, we we were fearless, right? Jumping off the houses, roofs yeah. and snow banks and throwing, a lot of guys shooting each other with BB guns, yeah. you know? Stupid, yeah. right? But we're fearless. A courageous guy, in spite of his fear, does something anyways. That yes. doesn't mean he's fully in control of what's going to happen or his, his faculties, right? But he's doing something. Okay, that's okay. Me, I'm not a courageous guy. I'm just a confident guy. I'm really confident in my skill sets, what I'm doing. I enjoy the fight. I feel confident that I can win. And so that makes me more dangerous than a courageous guy because I'm actually in control of my faculties. Uh, I'm in control of myself, and I'm controlling the situation. It's not controlling me. So that's how I kind of approach everything I do in life. Um, and, you know, it's taken me a while to learn all that stuff. But, um, you know, those that, that mindset is what allows me to every day – um, you know, continue to, to, to prosper and to, and to live on and, and to live a fulfilled life and not look back with, a, you know, at a life less fulfilled or with any regrets. Um, you only get one shot at this thing, you know. Um, some of us get a longer shot than others. I look at a lot of my friends, like Mike, like his life was cut short a long time ago, you know. And so every day got to make it count. And I can't look back. So what's what's happening today? That's all that matters today, and looking for the future. Um, but for right now, I live for now. So, well, I'm I'm glad to hear you have that perspective after you know such a long career doing this and everything. Because I know it's easier. I guess the parts for you that are easier when you're killing bad guys, but all the other things, the human element of the war zones you're in, and the things you have to see, and whether you wonder if it was all for good or not in, in certain places, that, that's hard. But again, just like I said about the guys earlier, when I talk in general about Iraq on this podcast or something, guys are there, they're doing their job, they're doing the best they can. And when they bring humanity into it, I, I, I really do appreciate that. But, you know, we, we're, we're talking about some of these themes on what happens to people who grow up in these environments that you're in and you wonder what they're going to think about you or, or what their political beliefs are going to be on, on the basis of the poverty and war torn areas that they grow up in. And, you know, right now we are watching yet another war break out in, in, in Gaza between Israel and what's supposed to be Hamas, but naturally everyone else around there gets dragged into that. And, you know, there is a fuck ton of propaganda from both sides on this. I see it online. I mean, you'll see stuff like Hamas holding up 
plastic babies in someone's arm like it's real and it's not and you know you'll see israel talk about oh we're taking out a ton of terrorists but really they're targeting one guy and it's like oh should they be bombing this how many kids have to die in this war and i can't imagine being in these types of rooms making those decisions you hope that it's it's humane people doing it though you know but what's your thought on that have you do you have any experience in that Yes. In that theater, I guess, where we're what's going on there and, and do you have any hope for any type of peace in our lifetimes? Man, it used to be statistically every twenty two years America was at a war. Now it's like every five or ten years we're right. in a in a conflict. Um like I said earlier, you know, man is a warring ape. I had to take an aspirin real quick. Um <laughs> <laughs> But uh, well first let me let me kind of backtrack a little bit you know, about humanitarianism, things like that, right? You know, in, in, in Afghanistan, we used to do what was called um, uh, med, uh, med, ops, med something, I can't remember now, but basically we would go out with truck full of uh, bandages, medicine, uh, the medics, the PAs, and we would go to these villages and we'd set up, set up security to protect us, and then we'd invite all the villagers to come out and whatever your sickness is or whatever you need help with, you know, our PAs, our docs would look at them. We'd give them medicine, you know, treat them, um, give them a little first aid kit, you know. Um, we did that quite a bit. And there were times I remember after we, you know, had the whole village out there, they're all happy, you know. You know, we got them squared away. We would leave, and right after we left, Taliban would come in and literally take all, everything away and beat the shit out of everybody for taking any kind of aid from us, right? And they'd take all the medicine and stuff like that. Um, you know how we know? Because we'd send a drone, fly drone back over, <laughs> and we'd watch it go down, you know? Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, to your point about, you know, what, do, what will the children remember? Well, they'll also remember that, you know, they've been— uh, who the bad guys are in, inside the perimeter well as well, right? It's not just the, the Americans, but, uh, you know, I think they'll know. And even right now, you know, I don't want to be political, you know, you know, Hamas, right? So, you know, there's enough reporting out there showing, you know, that a lot of the Palestinians are not happy with Hamas because they're actually taking their humanitarian aid, you know, and, and doing stuff like that. And so already, you know, a lot of the Palestinians are going, you know what? These guys are actually the bad guys. Again, I'm not trying to, I don't want to get in the middle of this thing. Um, not my fight, not my, you know, don't care. That's, let them fight their own thing. We, like you said earlier, not, we're not the world's policemen anymore. And, uh, and honestly, I think about my son, you know, like I said, he's, he's a Green Beret. Um, and I sure as hell hate to see him get killed somewhere, find some stupid right. ass war for somebody else over some politics and bullshit, right? And right. I'm convinced that Ukraine, we're involved in Ukraine just because um, there is, there's a there's a side, there's a capitalistic side on that. Sure, you know, always and, is. and there's people profiting, and we know, and I'm not going into politics, on, but we know who's involved in that stuff. Um, people are making money um, with their investments in, the, in that country, and there's a lot. So- it's not I, just Ukraine either. It yeah, no, it's, it's a lot, yeah. right? And so, you know, I think about, you know, my son, although he signed up to be a soldier, he didn't sign up to be slaughtered, you know, so some other politician and his kids can get rich. Um, and and so that's why, you know, I've, I've changed my tune quite a bit over the years. Um, I'm not, I don't regret having been a soldier. I'm always happy to be a soldier. Um, I like it when we do good things. We save people's lives and we help people. Um but I'm not a happy camper when I see shit like happening in Mogadishu with Bill Clinton or what just recently happened in Kabul. You know, that is bullshit. Um, and a lot of white lives were wasted for these politicians to profit. And that's the end of the story. And, and so, we'll, no, we'll always be at war. Um, we'll always be at war because it always comes back to, you know, money, power, pussy. You know, at the end of the day, you know, men are always going to fight for that. Um, and there's always going to be a new dog that grows up, wants to be the alpha, and he's going to, you know, and it's going to continue on in perpetuity. Um, 12,000 wars plus since uh, the dawn of man, you know, we're always fighting. And uh, what do we fight over? We fight over what? Power, land, money, procreation, well, control, the, yeah, you know? And, yeah, and there's security. also, there's such a tribal aspect 
that still is so inherent around the world. I mean, my naive ass sometimes will have the thought of like, damn, with all this connectivity now, can we get out of tribes? And then you go online and you realize there's even bigger tribes on there. Yeah. You know, because people feel like they have to be a part of something. It, it could be everything. It could be <laughs> something from, you know, a group of political beliefs, religious beliefs, some type of power belief, you know, we, we certainly see, see a lot of that in, in countries around the world. And something in humans, despite the more information we get access to and the more people we can get some access to to understand even just a little bit about their experience, we still don't get out of that out of that protocol. And what ends up happening to me is we see de dehumanization all the time on, on every side of things too. Yeah. You know, it's, and, and listen, I get caught up in it too. We sit here on a podcast and microphones talking about a couple wars happening around the world, regardless of what of our opinions are on the sides involved. Right now, as we talk, there's people just getting fucking murked and killed, including innocent civilians all the time. Yeah. And you, and I admit it, I lose sight of that sometimes. And then I think about people who don't even stop to think about losing sight of it. And they'll just, they'll just keep politicizing it or using it for whatever their team wants to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, you, you're right. I've said this before. People want to belong to something. They want to belong yes. to a group. It doesn't matter what it is. If yes. it means, you know, being a part of, you know, David Koresh or, you know, if it belongs to some cult group, being a terrorist group, being a part of a football league, whatever, man. People want to belong. And they'll, whoever will accept them, they'll, that's why a lot of terrorists are young men. Um, they're easy, man. They're malleable. They're easy to, you know, they're looking for something. They're looking to be a part of something. They're, they can easily be shaped. A way of thinking can be shaped. And they're easy to recruit. Um, you know, I mean, what was it? Uh, Jim Jones, man. Yeah. You know, think yeah. about that. How do you convince over 900 people to drink poison Kool-Aid and kill yourself and your kids? You know? You know what's crazy? <laughs> I'm glad you bring up that example because I – and I, I'm someone who should be way more educated on that case than I am. But I, I, I know the basics of that. I, I did see a documentary on that back in the day. But like he convinced all these people to kill themselves and it sounds so crazy and out there. But I wonder if I'm crazy looking at this world now and, and looking within our own country and saying to myself – Oh my God, we we have plenty of people who would be ripe to fall for something like that. Uh, absolutely, mass hypnosis, right? So, um, look look at World War II Germany. They convinced yeah. the Germans yeah. the that the Jews were bad. Yeah, you know, it, and what was it uh, quick, quick? Yeah, yeah. They said if you repeat a lie enough times, usually within thirty to ninety days. People will believe it's true, even in the face of facts, right? They call it uh, information escalation bias. Yes. In the face of facts, they will still deny it. It's like, but here's the information, and they still deny it. People are, uh, it's programming, and uh, and, the, and the politicians are great manipulators. They understand, again, the human condition. They understand how to manipulate people's thoughts and mindset and convictions. Um, I mean... I mean, let's look at, let's be honest, man. If we can be honest here, you know, not everybody's going to agree with what you're here to do. <laughs> you know, think, think about this. H how do we go from protect the children to now going, yeah, pedophilia is okay. Yeah, we can change their sex, let kids change their own sex, take the kids away from their parents if they don't want to agree to change their sex. How do we get to this point where we think that's okay as human beings? How, where do we, I mean, I just don't get that part, you know? Um, but it's all because of this manipulation, right? It's it's a mass machine that's been working for a very long time. Um, it's been brainwashing. And I actually think it goes all the way back to, remember, Dr. Spock, you know, don't spank your kids. Um, I think he probably had a lot of it, had his genesis all as far back as then. Um, you know, it is a form of programming. And and the people that are going to stay above it are the critical thinkers that really stop and think that, think that it was very hard and and do their analysis and go, you know what, this is bullshit. Uh, you know, and if you have any moral beliefs, and, and even now, right, they're trying to, you know, this is why there's such an attack on the nuclear family and 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 religion is is they want to remove the moral courage that we have that's, you know, we're trained into our children. We want to move all that, you know. Now they're actually saying, you know, the children really aren't your children. They belong to all of us. Like, what the fuck? 
who came up with that idea, right? It actually was his. Right. It was actually yeah. Hillary Clinton that said that one time. Remember, it takes a village to, to, to raise a child. She started that bullshit, right? Because Africans said that, right? So she thought that was a good idea. And we're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, a village takes a village to change a, uh, to raise a child. You know, like now that's that's morphed into like you know, you, it's it's morphed not, you into can, we own. Yeah, 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 you know, and and so the education system, right? You don't have, you don't get to say uh, what we teach your kids. That's our job. No. No, you work for me, dumb bitch. You know, and when I refer to that, I'm talking about the head of the education system, you know, that's making all these stupid calls. At the end of the day, my kids are my kids. Your job is to, tra- is to teach my kids the fundamentals, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, et cetera, not anything else outside of that. And when it comes to other stuff, that's my responsibility as a parent. But uh, they're taking all that from them, you know, and why? Because they know that the children, the children are the future. They also know if they can control the children, control their minds now, they've controlled the next generation. And uh, me, you know, they're looking at me as the old dog. You know, I might still get in their way. They might want to take me out, but, uh, (laughs) you know, but, you know, eventually I'll be gone. It's like, okay, that troublemaker's gone. We don't have to worry about him influencing um, the the future. But uh, I I, I never thought that I would ever see the times that we're living in now. Um, I look back in history, you know, we've had, you know, as we go through history, you know, we had, you know, the generation of the hippies, you know, we thought that was, oh my God, you look at these hippies, drugs and open sex, you know, we look back, you know, back into the, you know, the roaring, what is it, thirties, you know, twenties, yeah. yeah, you know, twenties, thirties, you know, thirties weren't too great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, the, we, you know, it, it's like it's that, a but, pendulum, yeah. but we're at a place now where this is bigger than, you know, you know, prohibition, alcohol and, and smoking pot and fucking in the, in the public, you know, this is like, Okay, now we're really going after, you know, um, you know, the base, man, of humanity, our children, man. And uh, I, I fear for my kids, man. Um, I wish I could be around for them and protect them. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fearful for what kind of life they're going to have. And uh, I think I think we're going to be all right. And I and and I look there. There are things I see out there and I'm one of the. I'd like to think the even keel guy is trying to take things in, look at what's wrong, look what's right. Not that I always know, but I do my best to be as balanced as I can with, with not being overly optimistic, but also not being pessimistic, yeah. right? So to get in between those two ways. But you look at some current trends, some of it I, I hear, I, I think it's crazy. Some of it I think is overblown and people will use some minority incidents to then make it the oh my god this is what it is just to just to cause a ruckus but there's no doubt especially in the immediately post covid era this is some weird shit yeah. going on as as like a society we're in a weird place people were locked in their homes for a year year and a half whatever it was and all kinds of things happen after that including by the way the stunted development of an entire generation right. with schools i'm so lucky that I and I think about this all the time. That I was not even still in college when that was going on. I mean, Alessi, you were in college. That totally that fucked up your entire four years. What? What? Yeah. How old were you when when COVID started? It sophomore started year? sophomore year when I was twenty, and then yeah, it was pretty much that, and then just derailed everybody. And you were online classes like the rest of the way, right? Well, it was hybrid, so they did some in person and then online, and then a lot of people like myself kind of decided to hack the system, and we're just like, we're gonna go online, but go live somewhere else. Right. And like, I will say, there's good to that. I enjoyed it. I got to be Miami, but also you realize, <laughs> Florida. He's like, but then you also realize a line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you realize if you're doing stuff online, it's very easy to not get anything done and get distracted. Yes. So my attention span went from here down where it's just like i could be I doing can something that. Yeah. <laughs> i could be working on something doing an exam doing whatever and i could also be watching youtube i could be looking at this thing looking at that thing and it's just like i realized as much as i didn't want to it'd probably be best that i was in the classroom because 100%. then i'd be focused yeah and also i i gotta give guys like alessi some credit though like he was someone who said well i want to this is a weird comfort zone i want to get out of here i want to be somewhere else i want to go do things and to the kids who did that and had the presence of mind to do that great when I was his age, I would have never thought like that. I'm like, all right, this will end at some point. Yeah. And you know, you don't know what that does to you. So you see that and you're like, now even think younger. Think about the five and six year olds who didn't get those year and a half worth of like learning the right. the 
the fundamentals of reading and the basics of math. And extra you could say something to that effect about almost every age level, and we've seen it even affect test scores, average test scores yeah. coming out of this thing. Yeah. And so I say all this because there's a book I've talked about a bunch on the podcast before, so apologies to people who have heard this before. But most of the time I bring it up, people have not heard of it. So I'll ask you as well. Have you heard of The Fourth Turning? No. Okay. So I'm going to go through this, the light version, so we don't have to bore people with the whole thing. But essentially, there's this book written in like maybe 1996, 1997 by these historian sociologists. I forget their name, but unless you could look it up. And the thing about historians that's bizarre is that ironically, because they study history and a lot of times, you know, get very deep on it and do a great job – they have this cognitive bias where they think because of their knowledge of history, they can predict the future. And what they don't, and it's not everyone, but what they don't often realize is that when they're predicting the future, they tend to change the patterns of what's already happened. Mm -hmm. And humanity is just one pattern over and over again. The circumstances and variables right. change, but the patterns stay the same. So what these guys did is they basically went like this. They went, here's the pattern. And they just airlifted it like this and said so that's probably what's going to happen do with that what you will I, we're not going to say exactly but like it's going to follow this and the pattern they found they looked it was you know they looked at this on a global scale but especially with america being like the empire of the moment they realized that these generational curves happen on these 80 to 85 year segments so to give you a quick example Revolutionary War, 75 to 83, 1775 to 83. Approximately 80 to 85 years later, Civil War, 61 to 65 in the 19th century. And then approximately 80 to 85 years later, World War II, 41 to 45, right? And then 80 to 85 years later, lands a smack dab on, 19, on 2020 to like the 2030 segment. So right where we are right now, what happens in 2020? Boom, COVID breaks out, whole world changes. So we're kind of in the middle of this period. But what they realize is these cycles happen because there's four generations that happen across those 85 years. So you always have these four types of generations, and you are then always going to have four types of eras that happen in those generations. The generations are 0 to 21, 21 to 43, 43 to 64, 64 and older, okay? And, the gener and, the, and each of the eras that happens is like – I'm going to change the names, but it's like the boom, the awakening, the stormy clouds forming, the crisis, right? And so every time that there is a boom – the people who are 0 to 21 are what's called the prophets. They're like the – so it's our boomers, right? They're growing up in a good time. It's post-war. America's at the top of its game. Innovation's happening. All this shit is happening. And then whenever you get to the next part, the awakening, the boomers are always coming of age. And now they're getting a little jaded by stuff, right? And the awakening is when you start to culturally turn in on yourself and figure out if all this makes sense, if we're the baddies or stuff like that. So you think about exactly what you just talked about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You think about the, the hippie movement and rock and roll. Plenty of good to come out of that yeah. as well, but also, you know – Certainly some some trends that it's like, okay, why are we sitting around doing acid all day, right? Then you have the period where it's like the storm clouds are brewing. And when this happens, the hero generation is always being born, okay? So the millennials, I'm a late-end millennial. We're supposed to be the hero generation. I'm not so sure about that, <laughs> to be honest. But four generations before us, the last hero generation was the greatest generation, mm. World War II. Mm. And they are born when the storm clouds are coming and they are up, coming of age, 21 to 42, when the crisis happens, every time. Every time that crisis period happens, though, you have the people who are in charge are the 43 to 64 age area, right? So that's who's going to be well, it's supposed to be who's going to be president. He's a little old right now, but you get the point. Like the CEOs of companies, the people running the military, whatever. And they are what's called the nomad generation. So they're the generation after the boomers, the generation after the prophets who are born during the awakening. And because their parents are often boomers or late end silent generation, I'm keeping it in today's times, right? There, there were trends that happened there where the parents didn't connect with the kids enough. And so then they – now that they're raising kids, like the Gen Xers, the nomads, when they raise their kids, they either like overconnect or they disconnect completely and you have a different parental-child relationship which forms the last generation here, which are the artists who are the 0 to 21ers born during a time of crisis. So it's 
mostly Gen Z mm -hmm. right now, and you see that they're changed by a completely jaded world that they're born into and often – on the average, have an odd type of traditional relationship with their parents. And so what happens? You have the nomads in charge, the Gen Xers, right, who are kind of that generation that was trying to find their way. And then the youngest generation, who's the most impressionable, are the people who maybe had some of the wrong patterns when they were grown up. They grew up in a time of crisis. Their parents weren't necessarily the traditional traditional parents, et cetera. And you have this perfect storm of like, oh shit, we got to make it through this. And the people who got to get you through it are the middle generation who's supposed to be my generation, the heroes who kind of get you to the other side. So I say all this to say, while I see issues with my generation, the quote unquote hero generation, and I see the issues that are normal for this pattern with the other two generations around me, I do kind of wonder if on the other side of this, we will find that way because we do still, even if there are some patterns that you've laid out that are forming that aren't great for freedom, we do still have some great freedoms in this country that other places don't have. We can see things like in this pattern, maybe a CCP fall in their influence around the world. Maybe Russia along with them not have as much influence as they were hoping to get and see more less openly you know, totalitarian type regimes, more democracies win out. The optimist in me tells me that's what's going to happen. The pessimist in me does worry about the things you're talking about, though, and saying, like, okay, is this a phase we're going to grow out of? I tend to think we will because the pendulum shifts a lot. And I feel the pendulum speaking out a lot more from your type of direction on that type of stuff right now than I would have five years from now. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. Yeah. Um, interesting. I'll have to get that book, by the way. Uh, fourth, is fourth turning? Fourth turning. Fourth turning, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. It's cool. a wild read. <clears throat> yeah, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> no, but interesting. Um, yeah, I tend, I tend to think that things are cyclic as well. Um, it's quite, I kind of felt like we're kind of in an apocalyptic era right now. Things are not looking, in my mind anyways, um, and this is partly my intuition, my experiences, my worldview, that... Uh, this is not going to go well, I don't think. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, we'll see, I guess. Um, you know, brace for impact is all I can say. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I hate to use that mindset, but, you know, I've kind of resigned myself to the ideas. Many, many people from my circles, and when I say many from my circles, guys like me um, are preparing for that, have been preparing for it for years. Um, you know, we're 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 prepared for whatever it happens if it means a revolution a civil war a civilization civil war leads to a revolution i don't know yeah I hope but that's uh the case. you know but it's really again it's the it's the manipulators on the top that are pitting everybody against each other and they're using misinformation malinformation disinformation to manipulate and and unfortunately too many people are not willing to do the critical thinking skills, not willing to really do the analysis and come to their own conclusion. They're happy with other people uh, giving them the conclusion that they want them to have. And uh, anyways, um, so here we are. You said something earlier that uh, we were talking about, you know, kind of changing gears real quick. Go for it. You were talking about, um, you know, moving to Miami during – you know, COVID, so you can, <laughs> which is funny, right? Florida. Hoo -hoo, I love Florida, man. Um, you're sorry. in Panama City. That's know, a right? whole different. I know, right? Well, you're there because of the because of the Navy team. They're they're there, right? No, no, like I, the, I no, like I the just diving team. No, see, uh, my problem is women, man. So I, I met <laughs> I met a, I met I met my ex wife there uh, a long time ago. I was doing something, and, long, you, and she keeps you coming back. <laughs> yeah, this one brought me there in 2007. We're not together anymore. That turned into a train wreck. Uh, um, but I do like the area. I like the demographics. I like just, uh, I just like how it is, man. You know, yeah, it gets a little wild starting in March when spring break begins, but, uh, I'm outside of that. Say, that's yeah. how I know Panama yeah. City. <laughs> but I like it there, you know, and, uh, it fits, it works for me. But uh, to your point about the Navy, yeah, there's a Navy base there. In fact, tomorrow morning, yeah, at eight o'clock, I got to be there and give a speech to uh, the Marine uh, Combat uh, Combat Divers Course oh, wow. graduates. You know, they're graduating. Invite me to come and give a little little motivational speech. So, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I'll be dog ass tired when I get there too. I know that, but uh, I'll work it out. Drink yeah. some, more, some more coffee. Yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll get you some. But you were talking about, um, you know, when you moved to Miami, um, 
you know, it's hard, you know, doing your online schooling, you know, you know, you kind of like you get a slack, you know, you got distracted. Um, when you said that, it made me think of something, you know, I, I talk a lot about success, you know, what are the three tenets for success? Um, one of them is you have to have purpose, right? What is your purpose, your mission, your goal? What do you got, right? Right. And so you, in your case, go to school, graduate. Two, you got to have a plan. It could be a shitty plan, but you got to have somewhere at base to start with, right? Okay, what am I going to do? Okay, this is kind of what I want to do, starting with this plan, and we'll develop as we go. The third thing you have to have, which is the most important thing you have to have, is passion, right? You got to have passion, desire to see it through to its end, to see the mission through, do the planning and get her done, right? And what happens is um, <clears throat> when we when we lose our motivation, right, and we get distracted, you know, because suddenly something interesting is on TV or, you know, somebody rings a doorbell and it's like, ah, you know, I can get back to this later on. Um, people will lose that. That's just, that's just part of humanity. And what gets us through that moment where ah, I lost my motivation, I don't feel like doing it today. There's one thing that gets us back on track and keeps us on track, which most people don't have. And this is what I, again, I thank my military life uh, in the culture too, and that's discipline. Discipline is mm -hmm. doing what you need to do even when you don't want to do it, yep. right? And so um, I share that with you and everybody that's listening out there, you know, um, you know, that's been the story of my life. There's a lot of things I didn't want to do. Or I got tired. It's getting harder. Um, you know, I lost the passion starts to wane. And when it does, what keeps me going and keeps me on track is the discipline, um, the discipline to do it any, in spite of that. And it all goes back to what's the goal. You know, if I believe in my goal and my purpose and I'm fully committed to it, then the discipline will be, it'll be easy to get me there. But if you take on a goal or something you're not really 100% dedicated to, nothing will work for you. Yes. Um, so I, I'm, that's why I was kind of thinking about what you said earlier. I wanted to kind of expand it's a on great point. just a little bit, you yeah. know, discipline. And this is what's lacking, I think, in large part. Most most people just uh, lack discipline. Why? Things start getting hard and they give up, right? Ah, it's just getting too much. And they divert and they go somewhere else. Did you know that... Um, 99% of the population, only about 0.01% to be accurate, lives a, the life, the dream life, a life fulfilled. Um, most people will never live the dream life. If I asked you, oh, yeah. if yeah. I said, I can give you your dream life, what would it be? Describe it to me. Tell me, you know, I want to pass. And I said, and then my next question is, well, why aren't you doing it? And then what comes out is well, you know, the dream killers, right? That's yeah. what I call them. You know, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm married. I got this. I got that. Blah, 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 blah. So we make excuses, right? Um, and this is the difference between those that live the dream life and those that never reach that point. And unfortunately, most people, in fact, this is based on actual surveys. Um, there was one survey I was looking at. 76% of the respondents that were around my age when they were asked, what is the biggest regret in life? 76% sorry, said they regretted having not lived a life fulfilled, not doing things that, you know, for example, well, I wanted to go scuba diving or I wanted to go to Cancun. Or, I wanted to visit, visit grandkids more, but I didn't do that, right? Because dream killers got in the way. And then they did another survey where people were like literally on their deathbeds. You know, mm -hmm. in the final throws of life, and it asked the same question. And almost 99% of the respondents said the same thing that the 70 the other group said, right? They never lived the life fulfilled. There's always something that got in the way. There's always something, an excuse. And, you know, sadly, man, people shouldn't have to go out like that, you know? Um, a quick story about my father. My dad was my hero. Um, I'm not going to lie. My dad was my hero. Um, when I left the Army, and it, I called my father every weekend, right up until he died in 2012, um, just to say, "Hey, Dad, how's it going?" Sometimes I called him for you know, you know, advice. You know, maybe I had an issue. Hey, Dad, you know, what do I do about this? Especially when it came to military stuff. You know, he was always there for me. Um, I always had an answer. But um, you know, I I think about you know some of the um, you know some of the the life's lessons that uh, that he taught me and. I remember growing up in Germany, and my dad would come home from, you know, this was back in the day of the Cold War, and he'd come home late in the evening, and he has the green army suit back then. We call them pickle suits, right? The green, regular green fatigues and the black combat boots and the baseball cap. He'd come home and sit down at the dinner table, and he'd pull out a shoe shine box, 
And he would literally sit there for about an hour and spit shine his boots. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were like glass every night, man. I mean, without exception. You know, that was the first thing he did before he ate dinner. And I would just sit there and look at my dad and watch him and listen to him, you know. And, and uh, you know, we'd have these conversations. I was only about seven years old at the time. I remember one time he told me something that I've never forgotten. It's about leadership. Uh, and we're kind of going into leadership and, and discipline. He said, he said, son, imagine that you've got a, f a chain link fence. Um, it's 10 feet high, barbed wire on top, cement on the bottom. There's no door. Um, it's a big 10 uh, boxed in enclosure. And you're standing in front of your platoon. And you want your platoon to form up inside that box, in that cage. He goes, how do you get them in there? How do you do that? I remember thinking, I still remember to this day thinking, well, you know, helicopters, no, uh, cherry picker, no, catapult, no. You know, I'm trying to think, I don't know, Dad, you know, how do you get them in there? He goes, it's very simple. He says, you call your platoon attention, attention, platoon attention, fall out and fall in on the other side of that fence. You let them figure out how to fall in on the other side of the fence. And I go, that's genius. <laughs> you put it on them, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was actually my first leadership lesson from my father. Um, and like I said, he was, you know, you know, he was the guy that, you know, he taught me a lot about discipline, self-discipline. And, you know, and, and the, actually the greatest, I want to share this too, because I think it's something that will resonate with a lot of people. My dad taught me my best lesson in life after he passed away. The greatest lesson I've ever learned from my father was after, was after he passed away. And so here goes the story. Um, 2011, he called me and he said, I got bad news. I got cancer, blah, 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 you know, and... He, he did finally pass away. Um, it was a very long, drawn-out death, and it was a struggle for sure. But um, I remember to, we thought he was actually cured for the cancer. He had a very rare stomach cancer, um, and not too many people in my family get cancer. He got it, and then after he recovered, within about a month, he came down with a very bad lung infection, which turned into a heart attack and then put him in ICU. He spent three months in ICU. I spent three mm -hmm. months in ICU with him. I never left. I slept there with him 24-7 um, until he finally passed. And, uh, man, I tell you what, that was devastating because this is my hero, and now he's gone. I remember thinking, now what do I do? My, my, my you know— my confidant, my leader, my hero is gone. Who am I going to call to now? You know, and then I thought about. It. I was like, you know what? You're it. You're the patriarch, and you people are going to come to you. Your kids. You got to be the the shining example. The same guy that your dad was, and um, so immediately um, I had to take on the responsibility of the burial. You know, the the services. Um, I had to get the uh, uh, casualty affairs office from Fort Bragg to talk to my mom about, you know, the benefits, death benefits. There's a lot of stuff, insurance, you know, a lot of things goes on. I never had time to grieve, ever. To this day, I've never grieved over my father. I wanted to, but I never could, especially at that time because everybody else was grieving. And I thought, well, somebody's got to take charge and uh, we've got to make this happen and, uh, and, and put my dad to rest. So I did everything. Uh, we had the memorial service. It was late at night or late in the evening. And um, had a, the color guard there, they did the, you know, the 21 gun salute mm -hmm. and everything else that went along with that, you know. And then when it was all over, we were standing in the back of the church, you know, passing, shaking hands, condolences, you know. And my mom, my sister, and I were standing there, and a woman walks up to us. And she introduces herself. She says, I'm so-and-so. I'm a nurse. She goes, I read that your father passed away, and I felt like I need to come here and share something with you about your father. And I thought, oh, shit. You got kids together? <laughs> he, he, he owes you money. He owes you money. <laughs> I was like, you know, where's this going to go, right? Not that my dad was a bad guy, but, you know, you know, hey, you know, <sighs> shit like that happens, right? Yes. All the time. You're like, ah. Damn it, Dad. You know, I've heard about these stories before. You know, they make movies out of them, you know, <laughs> fucking soap operas. <laughs> and so, anyway, and she goes, well, she goes, your dad, she goes, I'm a nurse at a nursing home. And she goes, your dad, for the last several years, comes by every afternoon, and he spends about an hour with a very old lady who has no family, no kids, no friends, nobody. Nobody comes to see her. Mm. She's got nobody. Your dad comes. He brings chocolates and food and, and magazines and newspapers. And he sits down with her for an hour and just shoots the shit, whatever she wants to talk about, an hour every day. And I, we were stunned because nobody knew this. The only person who knew was my was the nurse. And we're looking at each other like, wow, how did he pull that off? And nobody knew that. And 
then the other part of me was like, holy shit, that is like superhero stuff, you know? I said, here's a man that didn't want no attention, no credit. He did something out of the goodness of his heart for somebody else, you know, gave them an hour of his time, brought them, brought them things and make their life just that much better, you know, especially in their twilight years. And I thought, well, how the hell do I top that, man, you know? And, and it inspired me and motivated me. You know, and I thought, man, you know, how can I do something like that? And I want to do something like, but I don't want to tell anybody what I'm doing. And yes. I do, you know, and so, so it's a secret, right? But it's a good secret and we should all have them. Uh, if we all did something like that, you know, we're helping other people, but we're actually making ourselves a better person. You know, the law, you know, the law of reciprocity is at play. You know, when you do things like that and don't expect anything back, it comes back to you as well. Right. Um, so I look at things like that that my dad has done for me, in the, in, you know, and he, you know, another another one that you know for for all the dudes out there listening. Um, I remember my dad one day said, "Son, he goes, my, he was married to my mom for fifty seven years. They're the only never had anybody else, never got divorced." He goes, "Son, you know how you keep your keep your wife, you know, and keep her happy for fifty seven years." And I remember thinking the same thing. Like the, I remember the fence thing, the helicopters, a catapult, <laughs> and I go. Uh, Give him lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, no. He goes, the way you keep them is you court them every day like it's the first mm. date. I go, damn, dad, that's a lot of work. <laughs> but he was right because I watched now when I look back, I remember how my dad treated my mom. It's like he, every day he was courting her, man. He was like always mm. nice to her, very patient, you know. I mean, he had his moments. We all get them. But uh, very rare, man, did I ever see my dad, you know, get unhinged, you know, with my mom. And um uh, and if you did, it was really short. But uh, man, what a what a lesson learned. That's you know? an incredible lesson. You know, and I thought about that. I said, man, there is a lot of truth to that. And my wife now, right? I, I mentioned her earlier. She's Indonesian. We've been together for eight years, and uh, my my marriage is bliss, man. We because of, because of that advice. And now I I don't. <laughs> You know what they say, how to keep a marriage, have low expectations? Well, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of true. Um, I have low expectations. Um, I don't expect anything out of her. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make myself happy. You make yourself happy. Hopefully, we'll be happy together. And we don't. if we don't have high expectations, we should be good. And it's actually worked out really well. That's great. I, I've got a great marriage, you know? And so there's all these lessons, you know? And... Um, no, and lastly, to, uh, I kind of went off on a tangent again, like I always do. That's good. Um, and my brain's slipping because I'm drinking too much nah, coffee or not when, enough. <laughs> when, people, when people are on <laughs> but, the heater, I don't stop them. You go ahead. But, uh, you know, we, I mentioned discipline earlier you know, and purpose. Um, we've got to have purpose in life. You know, most people don't have purpose. Um, they don't know what they want to do. They don't know where they want to go. They don't know what kind of person they want to be, you know. And uh, if you can find purpose, you know, if, even if it means just being a good person, you know, I just want to be a good person, you know, in life. That's purpose. Be a good person. What yeah. do you What do you think the meaning of it all is? Like, this is the deepest, most broad question in the book, but asking someone what the meaning of life is. But You know, it, it, it's kind of an interesting question because we kind of talked about it a little bit in the car, too, you know, about different, per uh, you know, uh, what's the word I used? Um Dimensions, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's many dimensions in life. And are we really living in one dimension? Um, you know, some say there's eight dimensions. We're living in three dimensions right now, maybe four. But um, what is the meaning of life? You know, we're all energy. At the end of the day, we're all energy. Everything is energy, you know. And like I said earlier, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in religion. Um, it's a man-made construct, um, so I don't buy into that. Um, I'm very weary of that, particularly, you know, I, like I said, I'm a Roman Catholic at birth, but I'm the worst Roman Catholic on the planet. Um, Congratulations. I, yeah, I don't practice the religion. Um, <laughs> do I believe in God? I'm going to tell you this. I believe in a higher power. I don't mm -hmm. talk about what, what my belief system is. Um, my wife is Muslim, same thing. She's the worst Muslim on the planet. You know, she's, you know, <laughs> booty shorts, boobs, fingernail polish, you know, cigarettes. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, you know, the purpose in life, man, is just be happy, man. And, uh, and stop worrying about what you don't have and start focusing on what you mm -hmm. do have. Be happy. Um, be happy with the people you're with and, you know, 
get the maximum out of every day. Live for today because tomorrow's not guaranteed. You know, I've, we've talked about Mike. You know, he didn't know he was going to die on that on that set. I just I was telling. Um, I can't even ever pronounce your name, man. Uh, Elisa, Elisa, right? Alessi. Alessi. <laughs> Alisa, Alessi. <laughs> every time, out. every time I have a guest in here, we walk out of st- and we walk out of the studio, they're like, what's the pronunciation? Yeah. I'm like, it's Alessi. That's and a tough like, one, man. I've like, never Alessi, heard that one. Before. Alessi, Alessi. And then they get it. Alessi. Okay. I'm just going to call you A if I forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, A. <laughs> Alpha. Uh, but... Um, no, I not forgot my whole train of thought. But you were uh, saying that in the car, you guys were talking about the dimensions, the dimensions, and, and then uh, yeah, I don't know. I think you lost it, but it was good. You were on a heater before that. That was yeah, really good. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but uh, anyways, at the end of the day, what is the meaning of life? Man, be happy. You know, at the end of the day, just mm-hmm. be happy, and uh, you know, and, I, and sometimes we don't appreciate that until you get my age. Um, you know, I'm 60. I don't consider myself old. In fact, I plan on living to be at least a hundred. Um, I live like I'm a 20 year old, literally. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it. No, I really That's do. Awesome. Um, and so it's a matter of perspective, you know? Yes. Um, I have not bought into the, the, the dogma of, you know, aging. It's, and in fact, I was thinking about this earlier. It's like, you know, the military, they think I'm too old. I'm 60 years old, but I run circles around 20 year olds all oh, day yeah. long, you know. And uh, but you know, there's a, there's a standard, and, and I don't make it no more. And I'm okay with that. Um, I live today like it's my last because it might be my last, and I want to get the most out of it. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy my life, and not let other people bring me down. Not sit there and quarrel about you know, you know what they got, and what I don't have. Um, at the end of the day, all you got is yourself, man. You got your life. And uh, forget all the material shit. You can't take it with you anyways. And it's nice to have some of this stuff, but, uh, you know, what's really matter is, what really matters is, is uh, you know, is you. In fact, now, now I'm thinking about it. You know, wealth. What does wealth mean, yes. you know? And, uh, yeah. Took man, the words out of my mouth. Yeah, wealth is, you know. So I always joke about this. I talk about Tony Robbins and Grant Cardone. These are two guys that are always laying in bed looking at each other going, I wonder what it would be like to be Dale Comstock, right? And the reason I say that is because, yeah, they got more money than I'll ever have, but I don't want their money. I could get their money if I wanted to, but I don't want their money. I don't want that level of effort uh, to make money. Um, but those guys can never buy my experience. I've lived a very you know, a very good life. I've experienced a lot of things and I keep experiencing those things. And therein is my wealth, my experience. Yes. The, 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 the adventure is what brings me the wealth. In fact, again, we were talking about it in the car, me and Alpha over there, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. A, um, you know, very wealthy people come to me and pay me a lot of money to experience, um, to vicariously live through me for a moment, you know, yeah. and, you know, and, and so I do these things with them and he's trained. Oh yeah. I don't know what it was, I was going to talk about. So Joe and I last year, we trained a couple guys, um, together. What ready for this? One was a 20 year old, um, Catholic priest. Wanted to be a green beret. A 20 year old Catholic 28, priest came tw- to 28, right? He used came to be, to be with you and Joe. Yeah. He was actually one of my world. coaching clients at one point. He's 28 years old when he contacted me. He goes, well, you know, I've been through the diocese. I'm a Catholic priest, blah, blah, very religious guy. And I go, okay, and how can I help you? I'd like to be a Green Beret and I'd like to be coached. <laughs> like to be coached. I go, now that's interesting. You're going to, what, like shoot him and then, you know, have you scrape his thingy, you know? It's like, that's really fu- funny, right? But he was serious. I said, okay, I'm not prejudiced, you know? And uh, so he came to the training. And then this other guy, 28-year-old Jewish guy, multimillionaire, right? He came to the training. So both these guys, they paid, they paid us a ton of money, me and Joe. I won't go into the amounts, but it's a lot. They spent 55 days with me and Joe in Panama City Beach every 55 day. 55 days? Yeah, 55 days. And we gave them the whole Jason Bourne experience. We did everything from you know, night tactical combat swimming into the harbors to- How did you not sell this as a reality show? This is incredible. I'm, wor- <laughs> I'm, work- I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And so- you know, combat marksmanship, hand-to-hand, high-speed technical driving, lock picking, you name it, we did it. We gave them the Jason Bourne experience. And uh, and the funny thing is these two guys share an Airbnb. Together. They don't even know each other, but we kind of worked it out. They just shared an Airbnb to, uh, together. And uh, kind of funny. They got along pretty good. I uh, had a couple moments there where they wanted to, I think, 
one of the guys wanted to kill the other guy, but they, they, <laughs> which they sort, one? They sort it all out. Whoa, which one? Well, you know, I, I expect the priest not to do anything, so you know, he was kind of cool about it. But uh, the other guy got a little amped up about some shit one day <sighs> um, about a torture session we did. Um, <laughs> that's another funny that's story. Torture. Yeah, that's, please um, do tell. But actually, what I want to say about that: take, take out a bucket and a rag. Well, actually, he asked me. <laughs> no, he actually said. <laughs> hey, are you guys going to torture us? And we're like, no. He goes, I really like to be waterboarded and learn how to, you know, what oh that's like God. experience. It. I said, no, you don't know what you're asking for. No, 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 no. I, I know what I'm asking for and I'm paying for this. And I've I wanted, seen the movies. Yeah, he wanted to experience it. I go, look, man. So after a while, he kind of pressured us and we thought about, okay, how can we do this safely, sanely, you know? And so we set up a little scenario um, <laughs> where, you know, they had to do a bunch of street craft, you know, and, and uh, pick up dead drops, you know, the Jason spy craft stuff. And then that ultimately culminated with uh, um, they getting rolled up, right? So they get, ro they get rolled up. We, me and Joe and a couple of the guys ambushed them and uh, we bag them and tag them and, and, <laughs> and, and we haul them off in the trunk of my freaking car and uh, we take them to a location and uh, we got them all strapped up because like, okay. But the, the Catholic priest wasn't, he really wasn't, uh, he was not going to get interrogated, right? We kind of used him as, um, he was a facilitator is what we did. So basically what we did was we had two radios. Joe had one, I had one. I got this guy all hemmed up, and uh, I'm giving him the treatment. And so, the treatment, yeah. And so, you know, and but but the two guys had which circuit breaker, left or right? Yeah, right. They <laughs> they had a cover story. They had actually, I was surprised they actually had a cover story. They went so far as to build a website and had business cards. And I asked them, "What are you doing here?" Well, I'm, I'm here doing this and that. You know, I'm a, what do you call himself? A um, uh, a relationship something enhancement specialist, right? He asked so, so, and who is this guy? He goes, that's one of my clients. He goes, so what are you two guys doing here? And why were you guys out in the woods for three days? What kind of really relationship stuff were you working on, right? <laughs> you know, like, little butt boys, you know? And you know, so I was, I, was, I was putting it on him, right? And, and he's like, Catholic no, no, priest. here's my business card. This is my name and it's his name. And so I would call Joe on the radio. Hey, Joe, what's this guy's name? And he would, the other guy would lie. We told him a lie about everything, right? So he's not going along with the cover story. And so this guy's getting really mad, like that son of a bitch. You know, he's betraying me. He's like really getting amped Just up. Just like acting. Yeah, but he's actually getting mad because he's actually getting punished for it. Right? I'm waterboarding the shit out of him now. Right? <laughs> 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 and uh, you know, you he asked for it, right? And, and the guy keeps the other guy keeps lying. The priest keeps lying to him. <laughs> and, and so he's getting really upset, right? This this, this kind of really went on for a little while, but I had to finally I had to stop it because it's getting like out of it's hand. Getting a little real. He's getting really, really. I'm gonna kill that guy. Blah, blah, blah. And he's cussing. He's like really gonna go after the priest and beat the shit out of him, right? Because he thinks the priest. And I'm trying to explain to him, no, dude, chill out. Okay, game over. Index. I go listen. We set you up. He's actually part of the. No, nah, we had a deal. I said no. He's actually, you know, <laughs> he would. He just couldn't get in his head that we had set this whole thing up with the priest, and the priest was not guilty. We made him do that. Are you that. wearing like the ski mask and everything? Uh, like the executioner mask? No, he was wearing it. No, he actually had a bag over his head. Right, he couldn't see shit. And so that was part of the deal, right? You drown him with a bag on his head, right? And so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> see how much I see how much oxygen he likes in there. Uh, but he did okay, you know. So he got the, he got the experience, and uh, it took me a while to talk him down. Like, okay, please, if I if I take the handcuffs off, you're not gonna fight him, right? So, <laughs> and, uh, so wait, there's there's no chance. And this is safe space. You can tell me, there's no chance there was a third client on this trip that just didn't make it back. No chance. You sure? Everybody survived. You sure? Yeah, absolutely. You can tell me. No, everybody's lived. Okay. <laughs> No, we, sure. Joe and I were very careful about it. I was like, look, you know, we, I said, look, we cannot, we cannot hurt this guy or any kind of way hurt him, right? We're just go waterboard. We're gonna be bit. very. Actually, we did it very nice and civilly, right? So <laughs> as, as, as much as we could. You sound like Jim the Oreo man. I mean, hey, you asked for it, and I tried to talk him out of it, and he's like insisting on it. He really wanted the experience. But here's the here's the worst part of the story. He's a great guy, man. Guy was super intelligent. Um, very smart. Oh my God. You know, just a really good dude. I just found out from Joe yesterday, called me, he goes, dude, you're not gonna believe what happened. I go, what? So-and-so just passed away. Oh shit. Holy shit. 28 year old. Right. And I called the, his- The priest? No, the other guy. The Jewish mm. guy. I called his dad and his dad didn't want to really tell me in, over the phone what happened to him, you know? And uh, he said, when I come down and see him, we'll go out and have dinner. But- 
it wasn't, it doesn't sound like, I don't know what, I don't want to speculate what happened to him, but the worst part is, you know, I told him, I said, told his dad, I said, you know, fortunately, man, it's always the good ones, man, that die young. Um, I don't know how many men I've known that have passed that were just solid, solid dudes, you know, and the world is going to be, you know, we've just lost, man. We've just lost a superhero. We've just lost an angel, you know, and uh, it's and all these dirt bags, you know, they're wandering the earth and just screwing people and doing what they, and those are the ones that should be out, at, you know, taken out and, and they're living, you know, and he kind of, he, he said the same thing, but um, sadly, you know, it's one of those things again, you know, when you get my age, you start, I almost hate to say it because it almost becomes the norm, you know, you start experiencing a lot of shit, especially guys in my age group that are my friends, you know, and they're dropping to the left or right, it's kind of scary shit, you know, like, you know, you know what am I doing, you know, I'm good still, you know, but, um, um, yeah, what, a, what an experience. But uh, Joe and I, I was floored, man, when he called me because uh, it was, seemed like just yesterday we had trained the guy and and uh, he was actually anticipating coming back for, for more, um, which is interesting. But, yeah, the waterboarding thing was um, – where where are you where are you I'm sorry that happened that's 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 a quite a turn but you're doing this all in Panama City we do it in different places um, so you Char find like safe houses Charlotte, and stuff for uh, stuff Charlotte like that. and uh, Panama City Beach um, I'm trying to set something up like this right now in Bali um, this will be something really cool jungle um, water uh, get some get some tigers in there for it's, sure it's gonna be really good it's yeah. gonna be really really good. Um, and I'm, I'm working on that right now. We'll see how that goes. But uh, I've got an investor tentatively that's in all in on it. And um, if it works out right. Pull that billionaire bike. client? Yeah, actually. So. <laughs> that a boy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Boris. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, it's funny, right? It's funny shit. Kind of weird how I keep running these billionaires, but uh, there's a few out there. Um, hey, how often do you do security for a guy like that? Is it just as needed, like on a major trip? Like, you know. No, actually. Um, I actually don't do that kind of work anymore, bodyguard work. It's none of it. No, You're done. I, I'll tell you why. It's okay for a younger guy. However, there's a there's issues with that too. I won't do it just because not that I can't. Most people just don't respect bodyguards. You know, the clients, they treat you like shit. You know, they treat you like a valet. Yeah. Oh, oh my God, I got stories that blow your freaking mind. But uh the the problem with it, if you get young guys. Um, they become what I call a liberty threat, right? So here's a guy who's out drinking and partying the night before, shows up drunk or not not at all, you know, he's around the client, client's going, I smell like alcohol, and why are you staring at my wife, you know? It's just weird shit, right? That's the problem with young guys. Um, not all of them, but that's been my experience. And uh, so, like, when I ran this detail in Hong Kong, all the guys on the team were older guys, Um like literally in the late forties and fifties, um, even in their sixties. All like special forces. Type yeah, dudes. seals. Actually, one of the guys is a seal commander. He's a Blackwater attorney. Um, he's a good friend of mine. He's my personal attorney. Um, guy's a stud, man. Anyone to work security too? He's a stud, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, and, Savage. Then, and others, right? Some of them were expats from you know Australia, uh, Poland, Germany. So I had a I had an international team, but there were certain requirements that had to be met. Guy had to be a certain height, certain weight. Um, Baldness was an option, but most of us were bald because we're old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the old man liked that. He liked the, the, the look of the security detail, right? So I very much appreciate your team. Yeah. No, he did like it. And um, and then, uh, you know, so we had, you know, that was kind of, and the reason why they had to be big guys. I, in fact, I was the smallest guy at the time at, I think, 215, about maybe 8% body fat. Uh, I was the smallest guy, but... Uh, <laughs> Because we were unarmed, right? So we had to be able oh, to- Oh, you're unarmed. Yeah. You can't have a gun, right? Because you're in Hong Kong. Wow. Yeah. And even when we traveled, right? So we traveled the world all the time with this guy. You carry like knives or something? You can't even carry knives. And actually in Hong Kong, it's illegal to have a knife. You go to jail what for that. What about a bat? Nope. No bat? Nope. No Louisville? All you guys, your Kung Fu grip. Man, that's, what you, that's all you get, man. <laughs> so, but it worked. That was enough. Um, pretty intimidating. We saw, you know, a team of pipe hitters, you know, big ass dudes and- um, it was actually a funny detail, that particular one, because he was Chinese, um, very nice guy, older guy, in his uh, 56, 58, something like that. And I was just a little bit, I was 52 at the time. And uh, his wife was a 32-year-old Mexican model. That a boy. Big boobs. That a boy. 
Yeah, I didn't like her. I just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to say that part. He right? did though. So I don't know. But anyways, I'm not going to go down that road. But anyways, um, she had a little German. Was he? He was German. Spoke German, but I think he was from Hungary. Midget, right? Gay, <laughs> homo, sexual, and so he's a little munchkin, right? And he was always accompanying her like a little lap dog. He would sit on her lap in the airplane, right, in a, in a wait, private wait, jet. Is this like her? Huh? Is this a friend? This is her friend, her little best friend, right? And he was like, sit, he like up. literally sit on her lap in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a private jet, you know, like a little freaking doll. And he was a little gay midget, German dude, right? <laughs> and so, and then you had this whole international bodyguard team of black guys, white guys, you know, all from all around the country, you know, bald heads. And when you see us all walking down the street, it's almost like, what the fuck is going on here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was really, it was, it was bizarre, but. Um, it was an experience, but the problem was, like I said earlier, I don't like doing this kind of work because, you know, it's it's, it's problematic. Um, you know, you're treated like crap usually. You know, especially when the thirty year old, two year old thinks she knows more about security than you do. Oh, you know, that's a, and, yeah, you know, that's and she's talking down to you because whatever, and then she's putting the moves on, you know, one of your younger guys that you hire, you know, on, on good fate, you know. It was, oh no, I don't. I don't like it. Um, I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. Um, now, if somebody calls me, goes, "Hey, comps," and I've had this happen. Hey, comps, suck. I got to go to Africa. I got to pick up a bunch of money or diamonds or whatever. Uh, can you come with me? I'm in. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, because we're traveling together. You know, um, you know, I don't have to feel like I'm going to get bossed around by somebody. You know, we're we're on the same level, but I'm going to help you know kick somebody's ass for you if you need it, and that's it. Um, I'll do that. But as far as running a security detail, bodyguard detail, I'm, um, it's not for me. Well, how yeah. do you prepare for something like that? Like the job in Hong Kong, like what, what besides putting the team together of like savages, what are you getting his full itinerary and figuring out what floors you got? Like how, what's the approach? It just depends. It's all different, right? So, um, you know, in, in this particular scenario, you know, we, he tells us what he needs. Hey, tomorrow morning, pick me up at zero seven, whatever, and I'm going to go to my office. You know, okay, Roger that. We always assemble the entire team at, at his uh, residence. Um, he had three drivers always on standby: one for him, him, one for his wife, one for one of his sons. They all had three different cars. They all drove Rolls Royces and you nice, know, yeah, nice high end cars. Um, and so we were all tasked to cover down on somebody, go with them, and then just accompany them the entire day. Um, so we were kind of just let the beck and call, but usually we work pretty long days. Um, you know, we might meet up at seven o'clock and we may not get back to bed till 10 or 11 o'clock that night and then do it again the next day. Um, but once you do it enough times, you have a routine, you know what the old man wants or whatever the wife wants, you know, and a lot of times they'll WhatsApp you, um, or use Viber or whatever, you know, uh, application you're going to use so we use that as a means for com uh, communications uh, other times yeah it's more um you know if it's a more robust security detail like i used to um i used to r run presidential level type uh no uh, yeah presidential level types and ambassador level security details put those together um those require a whole lot of uh security uh, personnel cars motor uh you know, limousines um, a lot more logistics that go into that, but uh, and then I've done singleton work where it's just me and you know the principal. You know, I drop them off, put them in the bed, don't open the door, sir. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Roger that. <laughs> you know <laughs> that type of thing. So um, it varies. It varies, but it can be very complex, very complicated, a lot of moving parts, um, or it can be very simple. I've done both. I was I was covering down on a uh, actually not too long ago, a few years ago. I was covering down on a multimillionaire. She was 31 years old in, in Beverly Hills. And uh, the craziest story, I actually went to uh, out to California. I was on uh, the TV series SWAT. Um, so I was on one, oh, of, one of those episodes, right? And, uh, and I get a call. I'm not going to name names, but I get a call from a very famous guy. He goes, hey, my friend's in a lot of trouble. You know, somebody stole over a million dollars worth of jewelry from her. Um, and she needs, she's scared to death because they threatened to kill her, this and that and that. And, uh, would you be willing to cover down on her? Okay. Call, okay. Here's a number. Call her. She goes, what's your cost? Um, 
I hate to brag about this, but I was probably the highest paid bodyguard ever in Los Angeles. I was getting paid $2,000 <laughs> a month plus pass through costs. Um, she gave me a BMW 750 Li. Um, she put me in a $15,000 a month apartment right underneath hers. It was an amazing job, right? But, um, and holy cow. This Wait, $2,000 a month? A day, I'm sorry. A day. Uh, I yeah. was going to say. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I wasn't that high. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd be an idiot for working for that. Man. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, I like, yeah, I think I think there's a few people pay more than that, but okay. But it was just me and her. I was covering down on her, you know, and um, you know she had a real threat against her, an active threat, and it was a very convoluted story. I'm actually going to write a book about it. Um, I won't mention her name. I, there's some things that just I'm not going to expose her, but uh, the story will be real. And uh, man, just what a, was the backstory? Like, what was the type of threat? Are, are you able well, to say? Yeah. So, long story short. Um, there's a very notorious gang based out of Chicago and one person from this gang was a woman essentially befriended her, my, my client, um, talked her, conned her into giving her over a million dollars worth of diamonds because she goes, oh yeah, this is my, this is my husband. He's a billionaire. Oh, gonna, my fiance is a billionaire. I'm going to marry him. I want these diamonds for the wedding. Uh, and my client believed her because, you know, she talked to the billionaire. He had no idea what the freak was going on. By the way, he was married and had kids in London, Ooh. right? And this chick, <laughs> turns out this chick was a hooker, um, cayenne call girl, and set him up, set her up, stole the jewelry. Um, and now she goes back to the gang. Um, my client sends a guy that knows this gang to go talk to him, go, hey, just give her the jewelry back and she'll drop it. And they were like, no, you tell this bitch if she doesn't shut up, we're going to rape her and kill her in an alley, right? So, Oof. and they're not, and I've, look, I had a lot of people involved, Chicago uh, gang, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, gang unit. I've had uh, California marshals, uh, LAPD, a lot of people involved in this thing, right on up to government agency. And they're like, uh, if the guy says it, believe him. He's going to do it. I'm like, holy shit, it's a real, these guys are joking around. So I ended up getting armed. I had my, uh, my cousin out there brought me my father, my uncle's uh, 45, I brought body armor. And it's like, all right, this, this is no bullshit here. So she was scared to death. Um, me, not so much. But that whole thing turned into, you know, all this weird, I went from being a bodyguard to now I'm a private eye to, uh, you know, now I'm doing the Mutt and Jeff thing, you know, with the billionaire. I've got him in Starbucks, you know, and. You know, and I'm trying to politely tell him that you should probably pay her that money because you got a wife and kids in London. And, and if this comes out, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> and she's going to go to L.A. Times, you know. And, you know, I find myself in this really weird world all of a sudden. But the weirdest part was, first of all, she was very attractive. 31 years old, never been married, no kids. And she fell head over heels in love with me. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Would this have been wife five? If that had happened? It could have been. Oh, uh, but no, it would have never been because as nice as she was, dude, you got to think about it. I'm like 50, I think at the time I was 56, and she's 30. 31? One. Oh, bro. And she had money? Dude, she gave me a BMW 750 LI. All due respect to your current wife. I'm sure she's lovely. What are you doing? You know what? That's Come why on. my wife is broke, but I tell you what, <laughs> I love my wife. And, uh, you know, at that time we weren't married yet. And I just, I told this girl, I said, listen. First of all, I don't like your friends because um, they're super way to the left, man. They, they, <laughs> in fact, when they all met me, when they all met me, she introduced me, right? It's like, okay, you know, this is my so and so. He's, you know, my security oh. and uh, he's in the, in the army. He's a veteran. That's what they look like. What? And I was like, are you kidding me? They, they like never met a veteran before, right? And they were like, oh my God, you know, and it's like. This is so cool. Yeah, exactly, right? We had these big conversations on the couch in the lounge because they didn't have, a, none of them had jobs. And they just sit around all day bullshitting. And they could only talk about four things. It was either about uh, wine, hotels, um, wine, hotels, money, and oh yeah, other women's fucking shoes and dresses, right? It's you're, like, you're telling them not enough critical thinking for you, huh? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and then if they ask me something about the military, you know, and I start to explain it, then they just kind of drift off into another conversation. Like I totally lost them. Like what the, it, you know, it, it, like really short attention spans. Um, but they were just so weird, man. Um, I mean, <laughs> they couldn't stop talking about Trump. I'm like, really? Can we just have another conversation, you know? And it was all bad, 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 you know? So anyways, I told this girl, I said, look, she, I kept asking her, I said, how long do you need me for? And she kept saying, forever. <laughs> and I wasn't sure what that meant. I thought, ha, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no, really, how long? Forever. 
Huh? Right? And I started realizing, no, she's actually serious. She's actually like wants to keep me. Now, did she ever use the words, and listen very carefully, did she ever use the words prenup? No. Dale. I know, right? My guy. What are you doing? Well, <laughs> look, I made it pretty clear. I was like, you know what? I said, I finally, I just finally said, you know, I, I kind of took this thing as far as it could go. We're not going to get the diamonds back. There's no more threat against you. You really don't need me, even though you pay me a lot of freaking money, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I got the weird phone calls in the middle of the night. Hey, I need you to come up to my, my apartment. I need to talk to you. Two o'clock in the, the morning. beginning of a porno? Yeah, almost, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it started to turn that kind of shit. I go, yeah, well, I'm never going to get paid again <laughs> if I keep doing this kind of crap, you know? And so I had to weigh it all out, you know? And so finally I just told her, I said, you know, I'm, tomorrow morning I'm going to leave. I got to go. And and she said, okay, and I'll have the limousine waiting for you. And I show up in her apartment in the morning. I'm getting ready to leave. And she's waiting for me. She's sitting on the on the on the counter, and her legs open. And come here, and let's just say goodbye, and stay with me for one more night. You know, let's go to um, where she wanted to go to Palm Springs, to resort. Let's oh. let's go to Palm Springs and just spend the night there. And then tomorrow, I'll put you on a private jet and fly you home. <laughs> and I said, you know, it's going to happen, right? I said, we're going to go there and do it like rabbits. I said, and I'm still getting on an airplane tomorrow morning, right? I said, so let's just let's just knock out the bullshit. You know, I said, I'm going. I'm going home. And I'm going back to Indonesia. I'm going back to, you know, the Good girl. For you. The girl over there. Good for you. She, she don't have nothing, but that's okay. Good I, for you. I don't want the money. You know, I said in three months we'll be at his throats. I said, Yeah, any other guy might jump all over this. He'll be a millionaire overnight with a hot wife. I said, sorry. I said, money's not that important. And this life, this culture, this place you live good is for you. not for me, you know? We can joke about it, but that's that's yeah. that's a real No, I, 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 I literally walked away and never looked back. And uh you know, she's uh she's never contacted me since then. She's never talked to me, even though I've tried to reach out. Hey, how you doing? She won't have it. Was this like three weeks ago? No, I said, I'm you know, kidding. No, I, no, no, <laughs> no. I don't. You know it, that that ch chapter's closed. But uh, you know Good that's for you. you know the world of bodyguard, man. It's um it got really strange, man. And, and there comes a point where it's like, okay, you know. <sighs> You know, there's a fine line between, you know, being a professional and then it's mm. getting too uh, personal, you know, like yep. she had me sitting down on a couch in the lounge and next thing I know she's sitting on my lap. I'm like, I'm supposed to be a bodyguard and you're sitting on my lap, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to react and get the gun out, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you know, we, we'd go eat and she, I, I try to post up somewhere where, you know, I could pull security and what happened? It'd sit right here next to me. <sighs> okay, what do you want? I, I, no, she'd order everything on the menu. We we probably never spent less than fifteen hundred dollars a night on dinner. Oh my god! Yeah, it's insane, right? That kind of money must be nice. And yeah, and then she's like, "Hey, she she had a BMW seven fifty Li, a white one. I like BMWs. I got a couple of them." And um, and she goes, "You know what?" She goes, "I tell you what, I'm gonna buy me a black one. This one's yours." <laughs> I said, basically she was trying to keep me around you know yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't keep none of that shit and i just walked away with my paycheck you know and i just called it a day man she was a good girl i'm not you know i'm not bashing her it's just uh you know sometimes you gotta you, i guess it comes with age and experience you know you kind of yeah, yeah. gotta weigh it all out it's like is it really you know is it really worth all that you know and it's 100 it wasn't man at the end of the day i'm 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 where i want to be i'm right where i want to be and where i need to be so that's great yeah you know, you know what I forgot to ask you? This is off topic, but I forgot to ask you about this earlier real quick. Did you – so when you, you got out of the Army in 2000 – or out of Special Forces in 2001, were you in the Kosovo Theater when that stuff was going down? That's the only one I missed. That's the only mm. one I missed because right then I was transitioning out. Kosovo happened. That's the only campaign I've missed since 2000 uh, – since I joined the Army. Actually, 1981. Wow. Um, I have been in every campaign that the U.S. government has been involved in, um, with the exception of Kosovo. But Kosovo is more of a. What air about war. like Bosnia? That's kind of, I kind of put that in the same yeah, space, yeah, same, right? Bosnia, same, Kosovo. Yep. Um, I don't feel like I really missed out on anything. Um, it sounds like it was low level combat, anyways, you know, more uh, aerial type stuff. But uh, I've been in every other campaign since that. What was, I mean, Desert Storm was really fast. What were you doing there? That one I can't talk about. <laughs> that one I can't talk about. Um, okay. But that was an interesting one. Coldest I've ever been in my life was in Iraq. The, the coldest? coldest? The coldest. 
man, that desert can get super, super, super cold at night. Really? Yeah, yeah. And it gets super, super hot during the day in the summertime. Like, so like hot. how cold are we talking? Well, let me put it this way. Um, I was wearing, besides my military fatigues, we had this thing called bear suits. Okay, that says a lot. They were Patagonia bear suits. They were uh, fleece lined and they're thick, man. You wear that. I was wearing that. I had about four layers of clothes on. I had so much clothes on, I looked like the Michelin man. If I got in a firefight, I couldn't fight. And if I got shot, I automatically had a Band-Aid on. I wasn't going to bleed out. It was that much stuff. It was that cold. Ski gloves, ski mask. Um, holy smokes, was it cold. Because it's desert. You got rock and sand out there, no, no cloud cover. But it gets hot during the day. In the summertime. Uh, in the wintertime, not so much. Remember this? Really? Yeah, remember this was January, Shows February. how much I know. Yeah. Now, summertime, it gets so hot that when you're walking in the summertime, I remember walking, waving my hands, and I'm walking, the palms of my hands were burning. That's how hot it was. Yeah. It's crazy heat. Um, probably yeah, some of the coldest times I ever experienced was in Iraq. Sure was. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was uh, interesting times, too. Saw a lot happen there. A lot of stuff, man. Imagine imagine being in the middle of a desert, and you can look in any direction at any time, all night long, 360 degrees, 10, 15, 20, 25 miles away from you. All you see all night long, nonstop, is tracers going up, air defense artillery, mm. all night long going yeah. up. And you see, boom, flashes on the ground from bombs coming down, you know, all night long. And you see that for weeks. And then after a few weeks, you start seeing less and less tracers going up, right? Um, I've actually watched an aircraft get shot down and come spiraling down flames. It's like in the movies, you know, oh. or two, you know? Um, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting time. And there, since we're talking about that, you know, everybody said, oh, there was no weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, you keep on believing that shit. Um, what? I got, I got a letter from Department of Defense saying that I've probably been exposed to nerve agent um, because I was downwind from one of the sites. Well, the nukes. Huh? Nukes. I don't, about, I don't know about nukes. Yeah, yeah. That's what people are always talking about, nukes. But biologics, we knew they were working on biologics. That's different. Yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, I think they're, when they talk about MMD, they were, WMD, they're talking about uh, biologics as well. But there was there. Um, you no. got a letter saying you were exposed Pretty to something? Much. Yeah, and so if I... When did you get this letter? If I ever start twitching or doing anything weird, I need to go to VA right away. <laughs> uh, but that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago you that got that was, letter? That was right after I retired, so circa... 02, 03? Two, yeah, something like that. Wow, that... <laughs> yeah. Well, wait a minute. That would have been good timing to say that because they were trying to sell everyone that there were WMDs at the time. Well... Um, so if they're sending that this was, prior this was to the based invasion. on all kinds of analytics and computer modules and shit like that. They but were you've doing. never twitched, right? I'm twitching right now. My legs shaking. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably from all this caffeine. <laughs> yeah, probably. You've had a lot of coffee there, man. Holy shit. Yeah. I usually have a little bit there in the podcast, but goddamn, you're plowing it. But listen, dude, we we just did. How long was that? Like five and a half hours or something? Yeah. Something like that. This was this was awesome, Joe. Obviously. Sold you well. He's like, you got to talk to Dale. I <laughs> talked to you once on the phone, and I think I told this was like months ago now. I think I told you, I said, we're not going to have a problem doing a couple podcasts when you come in here. So yeah. I'm glad we finally got to do yeah. it. And, and thank you for trekking through and getting up to Atlanta Airport to do yeah. this as well. I really appreciate you for that. But awesome stuff, man. Yeah. You've had a hell Thanks. of a career. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. And we will put the link to your book down in the description below. Is Are there any other links you want there? Uh, you can go to my website, dalecomstock.com. Done. I, I provide a lot of trainings and stuff like that. Got it. Um, Instagram, stuff like that. So. All right. Yeah. Hit them up. Hit up Dale. You got to hear it all day today. So we'll, yeah. we'll make this two episodes, I'm sure. Sure. So this is the end of the second episode. But everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. Thank you guys for watching the episode. Before you leave, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. It's a huge help. And also, if you're over on Instagram, be sure to follow the show at Julian Dory Podcast or also on my personal page at Julian D. Dory. Both links are in the description below. Finally, if you'd like to catch up on our latest episodes, use the Julian Dory Podcast playlist link in the description below. Thank you.